I am Trinace Riggs, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, Virginia, and here I hereby call this meeting to order at 6 p.m. on this 25th day of April 2023. Thank you to those who have joined us in person and online. Madam Clerk, would you please announce those school board members who are present? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in the Holland Road Annex School Board Room is Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Brown, Mr. Callan, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Manning, Ms. Melnick, and Ms. Owens, and attending via Zoom is Ms. Martin. Thank you, Ms. Toniatu. And, um, excuse me, Ms. Martin, for the record, can you state your location and reason? I'm located at home in Virginia Beach and for medical reasons. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in observing that moment of silence for about 60 seconds. Please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. This evening, the school board has the pleasure to recognize some of the di our division students and our staff for their um, outstanding achievements. So we will begin with Mr. Culpepper. Our first recognition this evening is the Sister Cities Association of Virginia Beach Youth Ambassador for 2023. Please welcome Dorian Muncie. Dorian was selected during the 6th Annual Sister Cities Association of Virginia Beach Youth Ambassador Contest Gala. He was chosen by a panel of judges for demonstrating leadership, citizenship, global mindedness, and confidence while addressing a variety of audiences and communities. Dorian made a strong impression as he presented an original poem on the topic of world peace and global sustainability. He is a ninth grade student attending the Global Studies and World Languages Academy at Tallwood High School. A gifted orator, Dorian has completed and earned many awards, including winning the Tallwood High School Poetry Out Loud competition, as well as garnering sixth place regionally with his VHSL forensics team. As Dorian takes on his role as Sister City's youth ambassador, he will serve as a student member of the organization's board, attend local community events, and serve as the representative of the Sister City's mission in our community. Additionally, Dorian will receive a $3,000 scholarship payable to the college of his choice upon admission and enrollment. Congratulations, Dorian. We are proud of you. Our next recognition for this evening are the first two VBCPS students to receive personal training certification from the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Please welcome Tyler. Tyler, let me make sure I pronounce your last name correctly. Is it Ziemba? Ziemba, okay. Tyler Ziemba and Alex Ortiz. <laughs> Tyler and Alex are the Virginia Beach City Public Schools first students to take and pass the National Academy of Sports Medicine personal training exam as a part of their advanced health and PE personal training course at Tallwood High School. This certification required Alex and Tyler to complete 60 hours of rigorous coursework, five labs, three days of internship, CPR slash AED certification, and a two hour 120 question exam. The certification is preferred by gyms and professional organizations around the world and set these two students up for future employment. Alex has already been offered a position as a trainer at One Life Fitness. 
Congratulations, Alex and Tyler. We are very proud of you. Our next recognition this evening is for members of Salem High School's Visual and Performing Arts Academy. Will the VHSL Class 5 Theater Festival state champions please come forward? <laughs> Theater teacher Krista Vaught and her one act students took home the Virginia High School League Class 5 state championship with their show Unmuted. It is the first time Salem has won the championship and the only, time, only the second time in the city of Virginia Beach has taken home the honor. Unmuted is a show ultimately about survival. It pokes fun at what we had to do to stay relevant and engaged in order to survive the 2020-2021 school year. Salem High School won first place at both the VHSL sectionals and regional competition before winning the state championships. The judges' comments included outstanding, wonderfully choreographed, I can't think of anything that wasn't perfect. In all my years of judging theater, you are my first 100 score. Take this show on the road. Wow. We'd like to recognize these members of the theater team. Alexandria Stewart, Kaylee Howell, Caroline Orr, Crystal Chambers, Alora May, Evie Lewis, Isaiah Bolden, Jasmine Thomas, Gianna Thompson, Jolie Colton, Cameron Wheeler, Casey Colton, Melania Robinson, Mina Petromanalaksky, Mirabel Malone, Phaedra Diakopoulos, Sam Turner, Savannah Coulter, Sophia Heinbach, Maggie Southall Bartz, and Anya Kohler. Congratulations, One Act team. We are proud of you. Our next several recognitions are for First Colonial High School's statewide achievements in swimming. First, we'd like to call forward the state title winner in the 500 freestyle and 100 freestyle. Please welcome Kaylee Duffy. <clears throat> Kaylee is in her junior year at First Colonial High School. She won all of her events this season for both dual co competitions and at the conference level. She was also part of several state champion teams, which is why we're going to ask her to remain in front of the stage for a little bit. Congratulations, Kaylee, for being the 2023 VHSL Class 5 Girls Swimming State Champion in the 50 Freestyle and 100 Freestyle. We are very proud of you. Next, we'd like to recognize the 200 and 400 freestyle relay teams at First Colonial High School. Will the winning athletes on the relay teams please come forward so we may welcome you. Okay. The members of the 2023 VHSL Class 5 Girls Swimming State Champions in the 200 freestyle relay are Ellie Berenger, uh, Marsh... Uh, Maris Marchione, Marchione uh, Addie Roberts, Sarah Teague, and those are those ones. And then the members of the 2023 VHSL Class 5 Girls Swimming State Champions in the 400 Freestyle Relay are Ellie uh, L. Berenger, uh, Dara Duffy, Kaylee Duffy, and Addie Roberts. These athletes are also part of another team award, so we ask them to remain at the front of the stage. Congratulations, Relay team members. We are so proud of you. And finally, we ask the First Colonial Swim coaches, Cassandra Wilburn, and Kate Hudson and the remaining members of the FC Girls Swimming Team to come forward. And please join me in welcoming the 2023 VHSL Class 5 Girls Swimming State Championship Team.
The girls' team had 15 swimmers and one diver. They scored several points in all the events, well ahead of the team that won second place in the state. This is the fourth time the team has won the state championship. The team will only lose two seniors this year, so we look forward to many future successes. The team members are Ellie Berenger, Jill Collins, Lillian Crawley, Deray Duffy, Kaylee Duffy, Anna Everly, Charlotte Everhart, Nora Everhart, Brenna Ferry, Lena Machi, Maris Marchione, Emma McMath, Addie Roberts, Sarah Teague, Sydney Whiteman, and Maggie Wright. Congratulations also to coaches Wilburn and Hudson for this amazing achievement. We are proud of all of you. <laughs> Madam Chair, this concludes our school board recognitions for this evening. Okay, we are now going to adopt the agenda for tonight. Are there any modifications to the agenda as presented? Ms. Weems. Um, yes, Chair, thank you. I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda, and this change would be to remove item 12E under information, which is the bylaw discussion on student representative to the school board and defer it to a future workshop. Do I have a, do I have a second? Oh, second. You're seconded, or you, and you want to I speak? I have another change. Thank okay. you. Okay. Ms. Brown. Um, I would also like to move um, 12B1, which is our policy on consultants, policy 2-3. This was already up for information, and the policy review committee brought it back for, no, it wasn't? Are you sure? No, we, we didn't bring the consultant one to the board. We, we took it, we tabled it in committee, but we never brought it back. To, we never had it on for information. Right, Ms. Anderson? Right. I will defer to my colleague. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Franklin. Thank you. Um, I would ask my colleagues that if we are going to move 12E, that... Um, I, I was really hoping that we would have some forward progress tonight. So I would ask that if there are any concerns or questions, if you could please send them to Ms. Owens and I um, so that we can be very prepared when we do have discussion next time um, and address any of those questions and concerns and be, you know, and have something ready for those questions in the future. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Any other changes? I just want to say one thing. Okay, Ms. Anderson. Um, item 12E, um, the idea is to bring it forward for a full discussion um, to the board through a workshop so that we, that we would have ample time for discussion and questions. Um, so that, that was the reason. It was just, we just felt like we, there are many, many questions and so we felt like a full discussion during workshop um, next, and, um, I believe at our next meeting, we would like to be able to give this ample time to answer all the questions that we have. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Franklin. Sorry, just one more comment. Um, I just wanted to find out if it is, sits in a workshop discussion item, is there a way to 
bring that forward to the board as a workshop item as opposed to an information item in the future? So, I mean, in, in terms of being able to move it forward that night, so to speak, after we have the discussion. So in, in the past, um, there have been a number of occasions where we have had a workshop and then carried that forward as an information item that same evening. So you could do that, and then the question for the board at the that time would be to put correct. it into action. But usually, you'll if you do information, you take action in two weeks. Okay. Okay. Well, then again, I'm just going to reiterate if we could just make sure we have some questions, um, you know, presented to us before the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, so we had a motion and a second. The motion was made by Ms. Weems and seconded by Mrs. Brown. Um, and we've discussed it. So all in favor of moving item 12E to another date for um, a workshop and uh, adopting the agenda as amended. Raise your hand, please. Ms. Martin, how do you vote? Aye. Is that an aye? Aye, yes. Yes, thank you. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. Oh, nine ayes, are there any nays? I call for the nays, okay. Sorry. And there are two nays, so the motion did pass for adoption of the agenda. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to go to um, nine, the superintendent's report. Dr. Spence, we look forward to your report tonight. I need to vote on the agenda as amended. You did. You did, I, I did. Yes, you did. We look forward to your report and recognitions First, um, the report is always the second meeting of the month. Yes, good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. So here are just a few items of interest for you and our families to know tonight. Uh, first, we'll be recognizing our educators in a number of ways during Teacher Appreciation Week, which is fast approaching. That is May the 8th through 12th. We want to thank you for helping us by considering a resolution tonight recognizing the more than 5,000 teachers who serve our students here in Virginia Beach. Among other activities, we're encouraging students, parents, staff, and community members to use the hashtag LoveVBTeachers to promote the dedication of our educators. Parent organizations will also shortly be treating our teachers to lunches, ice cream, and other signs of appreciation. As we all know, our teachers are the backbone of our division, and it is important to recognize their dedication, not only this week, but honestly, every day of the year. More than 150 student athletes from multiple schools participated in the Little Feet Meet on March 28th at Tallwood High School. Paired with peer buddies from their elementary schools, these athletes were also supported by about 100 Tallwood High School student volunteers at this annual event, which is a partnership between Virginia Beach City Public Schools and Special Olympics of Virginia. Little Feet Meet provides an opportunity for young students with developmental disabilities to engage in track and field events with help from their general education peers. And the goal is to promote inclusion and acceptance and encourage physical fitness. I have to say we see some of the biggest smiles of the school year at this event, and I'm especially thankful for the staff, volunteers, and members of the Virginia Beach Police Department who helped make it a huge success. You probably know that our schools have been actively celebrating April as the month of the military child, honoring the families of our more than 12,000 military-connected students. North Landing Elementary recognized Purple Up Day last week by having military parents come to welcome students to school and Strawbridge Elementary staff members and students formed a huge purple star you can see there in the middle on school grounds. The Army National Guard made a special trip to Rosemont Elementary to give students a hands-on tour of their military vehicles and Woodstock Elementary rolled out the red carpet with students literally being saluted for their family's support of our military. And there were many, many more events to celebrate. The opening reception of the art of being a military child at Lynn Haven Mall went very well, and the contest inspired more than 700 entries from our students. Joining us at that celebration were the First Lady of Virginia, Suzanne Youngkin, Virginia's Secretary of Veteran and Defense Affairs, Craig Crenshaw, and senior leaders from each branch of the military. The Princess Anne High School Band provided entertainment. So we'll say this, if you or any members of the public haven't had a chance yet to see the artwork inside the mall center court, I encourage you to check it out this week before the exhibit closes. 
Let's continue to celebrate our military children and their families for their contributions they make to our community, our country, and our world. Next, the Office of Family and Community Engagement carried out a successful restock and roll event on April the 19th. More than 850 families participated in the drive through school supply giveaway at the Plaza Annex Face Center and at the Princess Anne YMCA. This event addresses some of the inequities, financial inequities that exist for our families, providing food boxes and supplies that will help get them through the remainder of the school year. Staff volunteers from schools help with the event along with student volunteers from the Land Landstown High School Road Campus Social Studies Honor Society. And of course, a special thanks goes out to our community partners, Anthem Health Keepers Plus, Langley Federal Credit Union, the Princess Anne YMCA, United Way of Southampton Roads, and the Food Bank of Southeastern Virginia and the Eastern Shore. Also this month, VBCPS celebrated the season for nonviolence with a community reception on April the 6th at Renaissance Academy. Our student artists submitted amazing art and poetry inspired by the season. Mayor Bobby Dyer and many community members engaged with our student artists and reflected on the significance of this season. This truly was an educational opportunity that brought the community together, empowering us to envision and create a culture of peace and nonviolence one day at a time. And then finally, I wanted to give you an update on Lansdowne High School students who are competing to have their ideas and products used aboard the International Space Station. They just returned from the Johnson Space Center in Houston where NASA scientists judged the top 10 student finalists from across the country. Our Lansdowne culinary students were there to present their three sisters stew as a hearty soup that astronauts and cosmonauts could prepare aboard the space station. And our health and biomedical students presented their designs for medical instruments that can be 3D printed and sterilized in space. In the coming weeks, we'll receive the results of that competition. Earlier in the school year, NASA engineers visited Lansdowne to work with students on their designs for a lunar rover collapsible mirror, lunar scooter wheels, and several other devices. And at a regional competition at the NASA Langley Research Center, our students were recognized as semifinalists and received honorable mentions. I'm very impressed with how our students represented our division, showing that they are future ready with their out of the world, out of this world ideas. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Spence. We have some amazing students in the school system, as we noticed, um, saw during the awards and as you just read about. So we're going, we're next on the approval of the meeting minutes for April 4th, 2023. The regular school board meeting. There was one correction to the minutes. The word without was omitted. The minutes were updated and reported on April 24th, 2023. Are there any other modifications to the April 4th, 2023 regular school board meeting minutes as presented and updated? Hearing none, I call for a motion to approve the April 4th, 2023 minutes as presented. Mr. Callan, do I have a second? Ms. Manning, any discussion? Okay. All in favor, please raise your hands. Ms. Martin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you, Ms. Toniato. We are on 11 public comments, and we will hear them until 8 p.m. The school board will now hear public comments on matters relevant to pre-K through 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. Speakers are responsible for being in the school board room, auditorium, or online when they are called to speak. And if a speaker is not present when called to speak or is not online or unable to unmute, when called to speak, the school board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment session. The school board also invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. Madam Clerk, would you please introduce our first speaker? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first speakers are Emily Labar, Natalie Gonzalez, and then Charlie Levine. Welcome. Good afternoon, my name is Emily Labar, 
and I'm the president of First Colonial High School's Gender Sexuality Alliance. No matter how the 2022 model policies are excused or justified, their original purpose remains the same, to single out transgender students from their peers. From taking them out of counseling to refusing to use nicknames or other alternative names, the model policies completely disregard the ideal of equity that VBCPS has worked so hard to promote. No matter how the 2022 model policies are justified, they can never be equal. No school codes, policies, or mission statements born of or inspired by the 2022 model policies can ever be equal. If the 2022 model policies are instituted in our city, I can guarantee that not only will they be used as intended to discriminate against part of our student body, but they will be further twisted to allow students in marginalized social groups to be further endangered. Last meeting, I read you CPS statistics, proof that compared to other Virginia cities, Virginia Beach is failing to protect its children from the very people who are supposed to love and care for them. In a perfect world, this would never happen. In a perfect world, you could go home confident that no real threat exists and dismiss me as a misguided young girl who doesn't know what she's talking about. In a perfect world, I would not be standing here. This is not a perfect world. As public officials and fiduciaries of our society's most valuable asset, our children, you don't deal with hypothetical ideals. You don't get to. You deal with harsh reality. You aren't blind to the threat these policies pose, the inequity, the injustice. So why are we still afraid? Reassure your student body that you are in their corner. And by that, I don't mean pull me aside to tell me that you care, because I know that you care. Do something to reassure your entire student body that we aren't here for nothing that our words haven't fallen on deaf ears, that equity is more than a trigger word to gain public support. 30 seconds. It's a promise. Thank you. Our next speaker is Natalie Gonzalez, Charlie Levine, and then Addison McGinty. Welcome. Good evening. I would like to introduce a few points my peers will elaborate on. There is no harm in addressing the needs and treatment of transgender students through legislation, but in doing so, it is vital to consult transgender students to deeply consider their shared experiences and insights and to use their concerns and thoughts as a foundation for policy and positive change. Unfortunately, this policy does not take into account the thoughts and feelings of trans students. It does not even take into account the pediatricians, psychologist, or other specialist who would be important to contact in any sort of policy affecting students' mental health. It lacks nuance on all fronts, from professionals and transgender people alike. Something that should also be noted is that the policy's concern over the feelings of a parent takes front and center, only later to be followed by the actual legislation regarding trans youth. The section on the policy itself is overshadowed by the three paragraphs before it, speaking exclusively about parental rights. It is uncontroversial to say that a school should respect the values and beliefs of a parent, but the issue arises when those beliefs explicitly restrict a child's ability to express themselves freely. Transgender children are vulnerable to harassment, and oftentimes the culprits are the families themselves. A school environment that respects the authority of the parents, but not the privacy of the individual child, fails to act as a positive resource for transgender kids. Transgender students, like all students, spend a lot of their time in school. For many, it is the only part of their day where they feel safe and comfortable in expressing their gender identity. This policy that mandates dead naming without explicit parental permission delegitimizes the identity of trans youth in the eyes of school staff and even to peers. Their voices are silenced. Dead naming and being outed are both humiliating experiences for trans people, but by building a supportive and gender affirming environment, the mental health of trans people will greatly improve. If I were to ask, do you want what's best for your child, I'm positive everyone across the political aisle would be in agreement. Trans children cannot and will not be excluded in this question. 
What's best for trans students is a safe, welcoming environment that recognizes them, respects their identity, and cherishes their well-being. If we wish to keep our kids happy and healthy, the solution is not found in restricting biased legislation. It is only found in acceptance, in empathy, and total unwavering support for equal treatment among students, no matter their gender identity. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Levine, Addison McGinty, and then Bethany Wilmoth. Welcome. Good evening. I'm here tonight to oppose the 2022 model policies regarding the treatment of transgender and non-binary students. Tonight, I'd like to reiterate some case law in an effort to persuade you all not to implement these policies, specifically Tinker v. Des Moines. Mary Beth Tinker was a high school student opposed to the Vietnam War. She, among others, wore a black armband with an embroidered peace sign to protest the war. <coughs> Tinker's principal suspended her indefinitely for her protest. Furious with the censorship, she filed Tinker v. Des Moines, a case claiming her First Amendment rights were violated. Simply put, Tinker v. Des Moines is the legal bedrock of all students' rights discussions. In this landmark case, the Supreme Court famously ruled that students do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. To directly quote the Tinker case brief, the school district's actions evidently stemmed from a fear of possible disruption rather than any actual interference. The one and only reason that schools can suppress students' First Amendment rights is when this speech or expression material, materially and substantially interferes with learning. We aren't asking for anything radical, just for every student to be treated with dignity, because that can make all the difference for transgender and non-binary students. Changing a few syllables in a student's name is not a material or substantial interference. And the idea that such a simple change harms the classroom is one based on fear rather than reality. These fears mirror the fear of black wristbands in Tinker, the same fears that the Supreme Court ruled insufficient to suppress speech. Legal precedent supports and protects transgender students' right to self-expression via their preferred name. Mary Beth Tinker fought so that students could express themselves within their school. Transgender students thrive because of the right to expression that this case granted them. There's a sort of clarifying power of knowing your life is about to suddenly and divisively change. As us seniors prepare to graduate, we reflect on our experiences as VBCPS students. I've been thinking a lot recently about how exhausting it is to live in fear. There are a lot of things that scare me. I can't even imagine how overwhelmingly terrifying it is for transgender and gender non-conforming students to merely exist in our society. These students have so much to fear at home and in their lives. They deserve to feel safe at school at the very least. Please call students by their names and respect their privacy. 30 seconds. That is all we are asking. We students are the ones who live in the realities created by hateful policies like the 2022 model guidelines. We are the ones who see our transgender classmates and love our transgender friends every day. So please hear and consider our request not to implement these policies. Names are basic, easy things to follow. I urge this board to enforce policies that encourage love and respect rather than hate. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Addison McGinty, Bethany Wilmoth, and then Eden Amato. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Addison McGinty. I am a senior at Florida Kellum High School, and I will be speaking in response to the 2022 model policies pertaining to transgender youth. School is often fraught by transgender children, with many fearing victimization of bullying and discrimination from the teachers, fellow students, and peers, the very individuals who strive to help those students. However, I don't think we are looking into exactly what these issues will consist of in our schools if we go forth with these model policies. So let me break it down for you. Again, transgender youth will be facing extreme levels of bullying and misgendering, which they already experience on a daily basis. They will be forced to listen to teachers not using their correct pronouns, which they already experience on a daily basis. How much longer will these students have to struggle for you to make your decision? But we've known this. We've stated this at numerous meetings of which we have been taking time out of our days to come here and speak. VBCPS holds an advisory period almost every other Wednesday, a time where we can focus on our social and emotional learning. We have to take a survey several times throughout the year, one survey in particular, the Spring SEL survey, which is coming up, 
A survey made to record our social and emotional learning, a survey that claims will be a way to help students. How, but how are these policies helping our social and emotional learning? BBCPS claims to care about our mental health and believes that this survey will help. But don't you wonder why not every response is, yes, I feel like I belong at my school. It's because we don't feel like we belong. And these policies will escalate the fear transgender youth feel when they step foot into your schools. The key issue for schools to address are policies that specifically mention gender diversity. The point is that diversity exists within every school, but unfortunately, there are numerous circumstances of which that diversity is disrespected and forgotten. It's our job as a board to make sure every student feels like they belong and that they are respected. But these model policies will do the opposite. They will not make students feel respected. They will not make them feel as if they belong. They will make them feel afraid. Afraid to walk through the halls to get to class. Afraid to approach the bus. Afraid to wake up in the morning. Is this really what you want for your students? Students are supposed to, schools are supposed to be a safe place for all students, regardless of race, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, ethnicity, et cetera. Schools that are willing to make changes to become more supportive and accommodating for transgender students have made a huge difference in a relatively short amount of time. If one school was able to make a difference, we as a school system can do the same. A difference that will support and acknowledge these students, recognize who they are, recognize their struggles. We as a board can save lives. Isn't that worth fighting for? Thank you. Our next speaker is Bethany Wilmoth, Eden Amato, and then Bradley Fish. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Bethany Wilmeth. I'm a freshman at Salem High School, and I'm here to talk against the 2022 model policies. I would not consider myself transgender. I am, however, a part of the LGBT community, and it's a really big deal for me to stand up here and share that part of me with everyone. I actually just officially came out to my parents last month. Sure, they knew, but it was still a pretty monumental moment for me. I really started to be open about it with the general public last year. Before that, I would share it with my close friends. There were times where people would share that part of me to others without my permission, and it felt awful. Even if they told another member or an ally, it was them going behind my back. It's a very special moment and not something that any person or any system should do for me. My parents were always very accepting. I knew that, and I knew that I could tell them at any point, and it would be all right. Honestly, the only reason I held it off for so long is because I didn't feel like it. The only reason I said it was directly was because my mom asked while we were in the car driving to one of these meetings. The reason I'm sharing this in the first place is because I just want to outline how important coming out is. It's important to consider how this would affect every transgender student. Even if it's guaranteed that they're sharing the sensitive information safely with trustworthy parents, the school shouldn't be intruding on this moment. The school's only authority to share information that the student has requested to remain classified would be if they were told something that could put the child or somebody else in danger. In fact, they're directly contradicting that rule if they were to disclose that information with parents that may react poorly in learning that their children are transgender. You can argue that keeping our current policies in place makes the school play God, but the fact of the matter is that the school would be involving themselves more in this child's gender identity if they were to intrude on their family dynamic and ignore the request towards secrecy. Our current policies are not extreme in any form. School nurses aren't offering hormone replacement therapy to your kids or performing, performing gender-affirming surgeries. It's just as simple as changing a couple key words in a sentence. The school will be invading lives if these policies end up passing. The school has no authority whatsoever to force or coerce any student out of the closet to their own wishing. It's inhumane. If you truly want the school to seconds. do what's best for your kids, rather than use this to spread your own hateful ideas and repress transgender students, then you would be against this bill. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eden Amato, Bradley Fish, and then Willow Bobrowitz. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Eden Amato, and I'm a freshman at Lansdowne High School, and I'm here to talk about the 2022 model policies. 
Since these policies are forcing us to take steps back, let me take you back to my first word, no. A powerful word we've been taught to use to protect ourselves and those around us. For the longest time, PSAs have said things like say no to drugs or say no to smoking because substances are harmful. So, after seven months, why haven't you said no to these model policies? It's not hard to see. They're extremely harmful. Every one of you has looked into the eyes of pleading students and adults as they've laid out all the reasons why the model policies are harmful to them and their peers. We've made it clear that we'll fight as hard as we can to protect the rights of transgender and non-binary students, no matter what people think of us or say to us. However, we know we're not alone. You've heard the flaws of these policies not only from students, but from parents and Virginia Beach residents. As explained in a peer speech in the previous meeting, other school boards have shot down the Virginia, the Virginia model policies and openly commented against them despite the possible backlash. It's no secret that these policies are life and death for many students. I'm urging all of you, please don't sit in silence. You're all here because you want to keep us safe, right? You're here for our best interests, right? Each and every one of you took time to campaign and run for the position you hold today to protect us, so the time is now. These policies are not in our best interests. We've all been crying for help for months because people's lives are on the line. I'm urging all of you to speak up on behalf of all of us. Those of us who would be affected by the policies and those of us whose peers would be affected by the policies have all fought for the same goal, to prove how wrong they are. We fought against them time and time again and we don't plan on stopping. So before I step away, I want you all to ask yourselves, how do I want to be remembered? If you speak up and use the simple but powerful word, no, you'll be finally remembered by all of us. These policies may seem like a strong force, but I trust that all of you will help us emerge victorious. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Bradley Fish, then Willow Bobowitz, and then Ali Schwartz. Welcome. Thank you. The model policy is an impractical piece of legislation when considered in a real world application. Giving focus to teachers for a moment, I ask this. What teacher will follow the model policy and alienate their students just because it has been dictated by the school board? I have already had multiple teachers discuss with me the actions being taken at these meetings and how they will not, how they will continue to support all of their students no matter what the policy says. In addition to this, how would a teacher be properly punished for breaking the model policy? How do we plan to hold them accountable? If a system is devised to monitor teacher behavior, then it would likely be expensive and time consuming, as well as further anger teachers who now have to worry about additional constraints levied on them. People in general are kind and respectful to one another. If a student goes by a different name than what is on a list, then it only takes one correction to ensure everyone feels respected. In no world is this difficult to do. In no world is this something out of the ordinary. All this model policy does is cause an artificial conflict to arise. We already have a lack of teachers and certainly a lack of respect the profession requires. Why would a teacher damage their relationships with students? Just because higher ups they'll never get to know decided what they should do far away from any classroom and any sensibility? I am sure that some teachers may make the change following the rules set by this board. But I do not believe for a second that it would be a significant percentage of them, nor do I believe that this would simply go by without any ill effects on the students of Virginia Beach, which you serve. The model policy would be ineffective overall for many of the stated goals of the education system. But then, why do we fight it, if it would be ineffective? Because letting this go by uncontested signals that more can be done to erase trans people. We fight not only because we see the harmful effects of this policy, but also because we cannot allow things to get worse. We are working to prevent the sickness before it spreads. We already know how suicide is a disproportionate problem for transgender youth and how it would only get worse without affirming care. But putting this aside a moment, imagine the tensions that this policy would create in the classroom itself. A teacher who must consciously dead name a student every day when they call attendance is a teacher who is likely to break the model policy and be right for it. Even though breaking the rules isn't something we want to encourage, the rules should reflect what is, a pr what is proven a positive force as we believe in doing what's seconds. right no matter what. 
There is no reason to not respect a student's preferred name and pronouns the same way you would understand if I preferred to go by Brad instead of Bradley. People should be expected to have respect for their peers, their lessers and their superiors, and this policy is in blatant disregard of this standard for the sole purpose of hurting a minority group. Thank you. Our next speaker is Willow Boberitz, Ali Schwartz, and then Geneva Warren. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Willow Boberwitz. I'm a senior at Kellum High School and I'm here to oppose the 2022 model policy. The new model policy completely contradicts research-based best practice in regards to the treatment of transgender students. Previous speakers have already pointed out the minimal amount of research used in developing the model policies, but it bears repeating. The model policies lack any amount of substantial backing, and most importantly, trans people were never once consulted in its development, the very people who stand to be impacted by it the most. In contrast, the previous 2021 policies had over 20 citations, several reputable sources it cited, such as the American Psychological Association and the National School Board Association, established the importance of allowing trans students to keep their identities private and the importance of handling each student's case with delicacy and nuance. The National School Board Association states a student's transgender or gender nonconforming status is their private information. The district will only disclose the information to others with the student's prior consent, except when the disclosure otherwise required by law or is necessary to preserve the student's physical or mental well-being. The APA emphasizes the importance of establishing a proper communication plan with the student regarding their identity that centers that specific student's needs, and the NSBA recommends refraining from recklessly disclosing a student's identity to their parents, stating, it may be wise to advise staff to limit discussions of a student's transgender status to situations where there is a legitimate or compelling need to do so. It is important to note that no one argues for keeping parents completely in the dark about their child's identity. Gender Spectrum's Guide for Supporting Transgender Students in K-12 Schools, authored by the members of the ACLU and the Human Rights Campaign states, where possible, the goal should be to support the student's family in accepting their child's gender identity and seek opportunities to foster a better relationship between the student and their parents. These practices prioritize doing what's best for the students and puts their safety and well-being first. These model policies, however, take a one-size-fits-all approach to trans students. Parents must be notified immediately in order for a student to even begin being to be addressed by their preferred name and pronouns with little consideration for how that may affect a student's home life or their ability to transition safely and comfortably. The privacy of trans students is threatened by these model policies, and rather than improving the relationships between trans students and their parents, 30 seconds. they will force unnecessary strain upon them that benefits no one. Instead of taking a step backwards, let's put our students' best interests at the forefront and reject these model policies. Thank you. The next speaker is Ali Schwartz, then Geneva Warren, then Alana Spencer. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Ali Schwartz. I'm a senior at Floyd E. Kellum High School. We interviewed two teachers at my school regarding the model policies and would like to read their responses to you. As a high school teacher, creating a classroom environment where all students feel valued is one of the most important things I do. When students don't feel seen or, and respected, they are less engaged and therefore less likely to learn. At its core, this policy would hinder my ability to create community in my classroom and would leave my students potentially unable to share their experiences and struggles. This is especially problematic as an English teacher because students often write about personal and emotional issues. I need to feel free to respond and they need to feel free to write and engage with other students writing. In the last several years, I've had several students tell me they are transitioning and they've asked me to call them by different names. I honestly can't imagine refusing to do this. They have worked up the courage to tell me something very personal, and it's not my judge to p job to pass judgment on them. In my mind, it's no different than if Morris wants to be called Brett, his middle name. And teachers shouldn't be tasked with alerting parents when students ask to be called different names. Teachers are not counselors or social workers. I don't feel as though I'm prepared or comfortable having a conversation with parents where I'm essentially outing their child. As a teacher, I have no control over what students are assigned to my classes. What I do have control over is how I treat them, and I will continue to respect them as humans, which includes respecting what they want to be called. Um, the second one here. 
As a teacher who prioritizes the individuals in my classroom, I've often learned of and honored students' varied identities, including gender, cultural, and other identities. My students and I have stellar relationships because I respect and trust them as individuals, which allows them to be comfortable assuming to the identities in which they feel most comfortable. Students who feel validated despite their identity always learn better and function more successfully. Honoring a student's identity is the primary platform for their validation. Without that safety, they cannot learn and they cannot grow. If a student's identity is most validated through honoring, one second, uh, most validated through honoring their gender identity, even if it is different from what is documented, a policy that binds teachers to the documentation will undermine their relationships with students and in turn, the effectiveness of their teaching. A policy like this would corrupt the role of teachers as supporters of young people. If teachers are unable to see and honor students in their truest selves, 30 seconds. Students cannot be expected to bring their fullest selves to the learning process. It is essential that students are a priority. Students are protected and students' identities assume their rightful place in the center of their learning. Thank you. Our next speaker is Geneva Warren, then Alana Spencer, then Alex Astroth. Welcome. Good evening, members of the school board. My name is Geneva Warren, and I am a sophomore at First Colonial High School. We have to be visible. We are not ashamed of who we are. Sylvia Rivera, a transgender rights activist. They are not ashamed of who they are. Others are. Why should the beliefs of others be the reason why they can't be who they truly are? The only correct answer to this is that they shouldn't. No one should have to follow a stranger's beliefs and hide their true self. The First Amendment of the United States of America grants anyone the freedom of speech, but the 19th article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, and I quote, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. Everyone, no matter what sexuality or gender, has the absolute right to be so, and no other person can tell them otherwise. In stating the 2022 model policies will violate this universal human right and so many others. Liberty is not a right given to those that fit the cookie cutter views of society, but for every human being, age and gender aside. A person, let alone a child, should never be forced to hide who they truly are. From a young age, the messages of acceptance for our differences being our genuine selves and treating others with equality have been taught to us by the caring teachers of the city. So why should those morals be cast aside when it comes to something as self-defining as a name? I ask the school board, will you violate the human rights of the students and take away their freedom of expression due to your beliefs? Or will you listen to the children and continue to uphold their freedoms in the eyes of injustice and say no to the model policies that are trying to be enacted? As school board members, this should never have to happen. The children you swore to protect and nurture are coming to you, asking you to uphold the right to be themselves in the most authentic way possible, and yet faced with the possibility of death over their heads, some choose to ignore their pleas. Please, don't be a part of the sum, and reject the disgusting policies Glenn Youngkin proposed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alana Spencer, then Alex Astrod, then Jacob Cruz. Welcome. Good evening, board members. Before I start, I would like everybody to look around at one another. Try to find one thing in common that everybody in this room is. And yes, there's a right answer. Uh, it's human. We all are people, and unless you came here with somebody today, you don't know who's sitting to your left or to your right. You can presume what they do, what their home life looks like, and what they stand for, but at the end of the day, until you talk to one another, you have no clue. So we offer one another the one thing we have as people, mutual respect a wave, a smile, a hole in the door, it's nothing. Respect is nothing, but it's something we all deserve. Although it's not fair, people have to fight for this common cur courtesy. Decency has to be fought for for trans students. It's a fight, a battle, just for somebody who's different than the majority to be valued and seen as a person. And once again, that's why we're here, to fight this battle, to fight these injustices, and I'd be lying if I said it wasn't daunting. We only have so many examples to look to when it seems like every day there's a new hateful policy proposed against trans people. 
to look at these districts and states beside us to prove such horrible and life-threatening policies without batting eye, to see books filled with representation be sexualized, to look on the news and see another hate crime, to see another trans person lose their life to such senseless violence, to look at these politicians who are supposed to have our best interests in mind, especially as students, decide to look at someone and know absolutely nothing about them, but besides the fact that they're trans and without a thought say that they are subhuman and that they deserve every bad thing to happen to them. But it's not just that, as if the regular dangers you face every day as a person who is willing to be themselves, I need to amplify this, to put you in danger by making a policy that can take away your very life. It's terrifying just from the outside looking in. Maybe it doesn't mean as much to you as it does to trans students, and maybe you understand why it's such a big ordeal. So I'll ask you, how will you be affected by these policies? Do you have anything to lose? Because trans students have everything to lose. To watch these advancements be erased, to watch the progress that people fought for so hard to disappear, leaving a bleak future in its wake. So many trans students will lose the respect of people around them, the safety of the school that we were promised, a safe home people to turn to, and so much more. Yes, this is a great battle, maybe the biggest battle we ever face in our lives, but I still find myself asking, can we win this? The answer might not be apparent now, but until we do win, until what's right is done, we'll be here. Because I don't have to ask you what happens when a student has nowhere left to turn. When they are taking the final amount of harassment in school, the final amount of abuse at home, when they find themselves belittled and isolated, because you already know. Is that when you wait to tell us that you deny the 2022 model policies? Thank you. Our next speaker is Alex Astrot, Jacob Cruz, and then Jay Cook. Welcome. Thank you. What we want isn't something drastic. Despite the large amount of people, this isn't some monumental movement to change the status quo forever in Virginia Beach. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. We are asking you to maintain the status quo. To maintain the status quo that has led to a safe learning environment for our transgender and non-binary peers up until this point. To maintain the status quo that has led to Virginia Beach being the pinnacle of success when it comes to education. To maintain the status quo of respect and dignity being virtues within our schools. Because these policies, they would change all of that. These small policies are rooted in ignorance and misunderstanding. These policies and those who wrote them failed to understand what transgender people are, just that, people. These are people who have feelings and value the same things as us all. So I ask, what harm comes from them allowing them to have a name? What harm comes from giving them an identity? I want to be called Alex, not Alexander. And even if I want to go by my middle name of Charles, nobody would bat an eye. But for some reason, when a transgender student wants to go by a different name than their birth certificate states, this is some major issue. Parents must be alarmed and teachers must transform their duties from educators to politicians to determine what name they call their own students. All of this is because of one reason. These students are transgender. This isn't about parents' rights. If it was, I'd like to ask, where were all these parents' rights people when I asked teachers to call me Alex? Where were these parents' rights people when Jacob asked to be called Jake? They were nowhere to be found. And that's because this, isn't a, this is about finding a way to disrespect and demean transgender students, not about a name. These are basic feelings. That, a name is a basic thing. And these are basic feelings I'm sure everyone wants, on this board can relate to, wanting to have your name respected. So I ask, why are we eager to suppress these rights when we slap the label transgender on the student? I'm not asking for you all to start mandating that I be called Alexander instead of Alex. I'm not asking for you all to agree with every aspect of these model policies, or disagree rather. I am asking you to allow transgender students to have a name, to have an identity. I beg of this board, put people over politics, put empathy over ideology, reject these model policies and protect your students. 30 seconds. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacob Cruz, then Jay Cook, then AJ Cordero. Jake Welcome. is not here. I'm Jay Cook. Thank you. Good evening, board members. My name is Jay Cook. I'm a transgender high school student in Virginia Beach. The hardest thing to do is to stand strong in the face of an unfair fight. To think that a goal is realistic when you have watched hundreds of other districts across the country ruthlessly tear away your community's right 
to respect, to expression, and to love. When the proposed policies that face us threaten to take away our right to safety, our privacy, our relationships with teachers, and potentially even our parents, all of this simply by forcing school staff to tell parents when a student expresses who they are. It is the hardest thing in the world to engage in what seems, in all its essence, to be a losing war. Perhaps it is not as heart-wrenching for you watching years of progress dissipate at the hands of people who have nothing to lose, because you do not have anything to lose either. You are not losing the respect of the people around you. Your peers will continue to use your desired name and pronouns. You are not losing a safe and nonviolent home environment. As an adult, that is something you can establish for yourself. You are not losing the hope you've held for years that one day you will be treated like your cis peers, like humans, because you already are. You are not losing anything, but trans kids are. Virginia Beach students are, the same students you stand to protect. There are two places in which most students spend a majority of their time, home and school. The Bureau of Labor Statistics writes that sleeping and engaging in educational activities make up roughly th two thirds of a student's schedule on a school day. Outside of these things, the student is most likely either at home or engaging in extracurriculars. By jeopardizing a trans student's safety at home, by exposing their identity to potentially unsupportive parents, you are jeopardizing one third or more of that student's everyday life. By stripping away a trans student's school as a safe space for them to express themselves, you establish an anxiety-inducing environment in which the student resides for another third of their everyday life. What time, then, and in what place can students find solace? What time, then, and in what place can students feel safe, heard, and respected? What will happen when trans students have nowhere left to turn? Thank you. Our next speaker is A.J. Cortero, Kyle Clark, and then Icarus Landacker. Welcome. Good evening. My name is A.J. Cortero. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a non-binary sophomore at Kellum High School. For the last few months, you've heard a lot of speeches. You've heard testimonies from many students, both cisgender and transgender, pro proclaiming the benefits of having trans-inclusive policies in our schools, as well as the detriment of implementing the 2022 model policies. You've heard statistic after statistic, but I'd like you to hear some important ones again. The Trevor Project's National Mental Health Survey for LGBTQ plus youth found that an average of 53% of transgender youth considered suicide last year, and an average of 18% of transgender youth attempted suicide last year. Cross-comparing transgender suicide rates across access to a gender-affirming school space found that transgender youth who did not find their school gender-affirming had a 6% higher suicide attempt rate than the percentage of trans youth who did find their school gender-affirming. In short, having a school that is not gender-affirming increases the attempted suicide rates among transgender youth. A school implementing the discriminatory 2022 model policies will see higher attempted suicide rates among their transgender students. Additionally, the Trevor Project found that about two thirds of trans and non-binary youth did not find their home to be gender affirming in the last year. That's two thirds of trans and non-binary youth with parents and guardians who would not choose to let their child use the name and pronouns they prefer in school. The 2022 model policies do not protect parental rights. They protect and appropriate the prejudices of unaccepting parents. Currently, in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, transgender and non-binary youth with a non-gender affirming home are protected by the confidentiality of their school. However, unaccepting parents in an era where the 2022 model policies are implemented would have the freedom to repress their child at school, increasing the likelihood that their child attempts suicide. The Human Rights Campaign reports that 38 transgender people were killed in 2022 and 50 in 2021, mostly transgender people of color. This is not counting all of the untracked transgender victims of violence. They didn't just die, they were murdered. Violence against transgender people is a real threat. None of these statistics will ever change for the better if we continue to stigmatize the experiences of our transgender youth. The 2022 model policies reduce the transgender and non-binary experience to something that it is not, a choice. These statistics do not define our community, but they do reveal a very important truth. We are in danger. The transgender and non-binary youth of Virginia Beach City Public Schools are in danger. 
And whether we become another number in a violent or suicidal statistic is up to you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kyle Clark, then Icarus Landacker, then Charlie Bodenstein. Welcome. Thank you. I haven't been in the city for very long, just two years. But in that time, I've become close with several trans and non-binary students. I talk to them every day, and they made me who I am today. I don't know what I'd do without them. But if these policies are put into place, I, along with many others, will have to find out. Last year, more than 50% of transgender and non-binary youth have considered suicide, and 18% have attempted it. You've heard these numbers before, they're nothing new, but that doesn't make them any less heartbreaking. The 18% didn't come from loving homes with supportive parents. They didn't go to schools where they felt safe and welcome. Quite the opposite. These students would often be abused or neglected by unsupportive parents and were ridiculed at school for who they are. These policies would make that environment the prevailing one. These policies would take away a safe environment from trans students at school and they would re require that teachers out students to their likely unsupportive parents. As such, these policies are life and death to many transgender and non-binary students. These are real people who are being threatened by these policies, real people who will be neglected after being outed, who will be abused by unsupportive parents, real people who will be kicked out of their homes because of the way they are, and real people who will be driven to a point where death is preferable to a, the pain caused by isolation and lack of support at home and at school. But these students are not the only ones affected. I stated before that during my time here, I've made friends with trans and non-binary students, and unfortunately, I know what it's like to lose a close friend to suicide. I wouldn't wish such a fate upon my worst enemy. It breaks you, it shatters your entire world, and it scars you for life, especially when you know that the death of a person you've held so near and dear to your heart could have been avoided. These policies would directly cause the threat of grief and death to loom over not only trans and non-binary students, but also any other student who may be close to them. They would affect any student who doesn't want to bury a friend. Overall, these policies would only serve to incite abuse and mistreatment in addition to causing unnecessary death, trauma, and harm to countless students, regardless of how they identify. Thank you. Our next speaker is Icarus Landacker, then Charlie Bodenstein. Welcome. About three weeks ago, I was at a reception for winning a poetry and poster competition. The competition was for the season of nonviolence, which begins on January 30th, the day of Gandhi's death, and ends on April 4th, the day Martin Luther King Jr. was shot. This 64-day period is meant to commemorate these heroic figures and to spread the message of nonviolence and cooperation. But why am I bringing this up? How is this relevant to us tonight? Well, when I walked through the gallery at the reception, there were numerous artworks from grades K through 12 that contained LGBTQ plus representation. One that particularly stood out to me was a piece of artwork with three people holding hands. One was feminine with pink stripes, another blue and masculine. The last person had the non-binary colors, my colors. As you have seen today in the past seven months, our group has been advocating and we have done it peacefully as best we can. We have not stood here day after day criticizing your every move and calling you terrible people like others have because we recognize how horrible those words feel. We have been advocating for the rights that transgender people not only deserve but are born with. According to the United Declaration of Human Rights, every human being is born with 30 human rights, which include freedom from discrimination, right to life, liberty, and personal security, and right from state or personal, personal interference in the above rights listed. Although the US chose to adopt this document on December 10th, 1948, it seems we are abandoning it in the current day. But we do not have to. And we can start by denying the 2022 model pi policy which limits these rights. The policy denies freedom from discrimination as transgender students are being targeted and forced to jump through unnecessary hoops, such as written approval, which may never be granted. 
The policy limits personal security as students can no longer form their identity in a safe manner. Final, finally, the policy has the state interfering with multiple freedoms with the previous ones listed only being some. We do not ask for much, only our freedoms. I would like to end tonight with one more thing. It is obvious we are living in scary times. There is so much violence, fear, and hate. However, I have hope, and I think this was best said by a speaker that night at the reception who, referring to our generation, said, you all have not lived long enough to seconds. be jaded. We are young, and we will be inheriting this world you leave behind. Do not leave us with one where we will be unsafe. School board members Franklin, Riggs, and Callan told me that night that you were listening to us. If that is true, then you know these policies are dangerous to us. We have been, we have been saying this through research testimonies and pleas. This policy is dangerous. If you know that, then act. And that is time. Our next speaker is Charlie Bonenstein. Charlie Bodenstein. Okay, Madam Chair, that will be our last uh, student speaker. So our next speakers are going to be Heather Thomas, speaker number two canceled, then Matthew Cody Connor, and then Paula Chang. Welcome. Thank you. Chairperson Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, school board members, and Dr. Spence, good evening. I'm Heather Thomas, a proud elementary school library media specialist and a concerned parent of two students at First Colonial High School. I'm here to talk about policy 6-65 concerning library materials. I wanted to share with the public what is already happening in our school libraries. Parents have always had access to know what their children are checking out either by one, asking their children, two, asking school, a school librarian, three, or three, checking online on their student's destiny account. It has never been a secret or an issue for that matter. At the beginning of this school year, parents were given the opportunity to opt students out of certain library materials by completing a form. I know this form has been in every school communication sent out weekly to parents at my own kids' high school. There are over 65,500 students in VBCPS, only 12 parents decided to fill out these forms restricting, restricting their children's library access. That is 0.02% of our students. Clearly, very few parents see the need for the restricted access, and we must honor the 99.98% of parents. If there are other parent issues with materials, parents have always had the right to discuss with school librarians, and we have always welcomed those conversations. Another issue I have is that the public may have the perception that school library collections are filled with sexually explicit content, and this is simply not the truth. Let me share with you some more data. High school libraries have around 141,000 total books. Of that number, only nine books have been challenged. This is only 0.6%, a fraction of 1% of all high school books that were challenged. And of those challenged, some were never even checked out once. For middle schools, there are around 169,000 total books. Only two titles were challenged, and of those, in 12 middle schools, zero of those books were ever checked out. Something very important to note is that if these, models, if these policies were to take effect, it would shut down school libraries. Yes, it would shut down school libraries. Why? Because each school's library consists of approximately 10,000 books, and it is impossible for librarians to read every page of every book in our collections. Our job of teaching students, coaching staff, developing programs, promoting literacy, and managing our space would be impossible if our time would solely be focused on reading material to add to our collections. Is this what you want? Given the data we have, we are making a bigger issue of a problem that does not exist. Libraries are places of joy for our students and staff, and in post-pandemic times when we are trying to renew students' love of reading, please do not vote on a policy that would close access to books and especially to our neediest students. Students deserve better. Parents do not want this. Please vote no to policy 6-65. Our next speaker is Matthew Cody Connor, then Paula Chang, then Jill Blake. Welcome. Thank you. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. 
This should sound familiar to Mrs. Manning, who is trying to restrict books with explicit content. I found it on her website. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses will be looted, and their wives violated. Also the book of Isaiah, chapter 13, verse 16. But I'm sure Mrs. Manning has read the whole book, just as I am sure her proposed book policy isn't about restricting explicit content. It is about censoring ideas she doesn't like and suppressing diversity and inclusion by, eliminated, by eliminating access to knowledge. But I will not waste my time trying to change anyone's opinion by pointing out the obvious. I wish to read two stories to you, both of them true. In 2023, conservative groups and communities across America carried out a series of book bannings of works that leading Republican Party members associated with anti-American content. Enthusiastic crowds witnessed the banning of books by many well-known intellectuals, scientists, and cultural figures, many of whom were Jewish and LGBTQ. One of the largest book bannings occurred in Florida, where Governor Ron DeSantis pronounced, this is where woke goes to die. In 1933, student groups at universities across Germany carried out a series of book burnings of works that leading National Socialist Party members associated with an un-German spirit. Enthusiastic crowds witnessed the burning of books by many well-known intellectual, scientists, and cultural figures, many of whom were Jewish and LGBTQ. The largest of these book burnings occurred in Berlin, where propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels pronounced, Jewish intellectualism is dead. Among the books burned were the works of 19th century Jewish poet Heinrich Hein, who in 1822 penned the prophetic words, where they burn books, they will in the end burn human beings. We all know the results of the second story. Do you really think the repetition of the same actions will produce different ones? Einstein would call that insanity. I implore the school board to learn from history and vote to be on the right 30 side seconds. of 30 seconds. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Chang, Jill Blake, and then Carolyn Rye. Welcome. Thank you and good evening. I just want to say a couple of things for having read the policy that we're talking about with the books. A, there is no burning of books. There really isn't much censorship at all. And, and I don't think even at all. And if you read the policy, you'd find there's no requirement that every book in the library be reviewed at all. It's basically set out what they're looking to have done. So I think if, as a library media specialist, you may want to check what the policy says. Um, so regarding policy 665, many have spoken here in the past to oppose inappropriate sexually explicit material and parental right infringement. How were they treated? One effective mother was banned and silenced by the previous board. A grandmother bravely stood here uncomfortably reading sexually explicit material from a Virginia Beach approved book, The Bluest Eye. She was repeatedly gaveled down by the then chair, Mrs. Rye, who is here this evening. Why? Because the content of the book being read was defined as pornographic by the FCC regulations and our, our meetings are broadcast. So it's appropriate in the schools, but not for the listening audience. Speakers were vilely mocked, they were bullied. To decrease book challenges, Dr. Spence and Rogers changed the regulation to minimize challenges, and I doubt all board members can even challenge books. But at the last policy review committee, we became a aware that even without these proposed changes, Dr. Robertson and Roberts, Rogers have been meeting with library media specialists regarding ex the material in libraries and pr new procedures for finding material going forward. So why were these speakers ridiculed? What is in this policy 60, 65 that's so offensive to speakers this evening and to some board members? One, it defines sexually explicit content exactly as the Virginia Code does to include, and these are quotes, sexual bestiality, lewd exhibition of nudity, sexual excitement, sexual conduct, sadomasochistic abuse, coprophilia, urophilia, or fetishism. None of those you want your children exposed to in school. Two, it sets a procedure for new library material so that elementary schools will not contain sexually, sexually explicit material and middle and high schools will now have new sexually explicit materials added to a list accessible by parents who may opt their children out of the ability to check out this material. And three, it allows parents to challenge sexually explicit material 
currently existing in our libraries. It does not require librarians to go through every book in the shelf. It makes sense what they're doing. This is a balanced policy developed with Dr. Spence's staff and voted on unanimously by all policy review committee members, including Mrs. Anderson. It should be passed. If it does not, one should ask, particularly as half this board will be reelected next year, why any of this member of this board would vote in opposition to these changes which protect students and strengthen parental rights. And I gotta say, I admire all these students who speak here every couple of weeks, so I fundamentally disagree that is with some time. of their points. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jill Blake, Carolyn Rye, and then Laura Pyle. Welcome. Hi, happy National Library Workers Day. Yeah. My name is Jill Blake and I'm a librarian at Bayside High School. I'm here to oppose the proposed changes to policy 665. I've already emailed you what I think the logistical issues are, so tonight I'd like to talk about the spirit behind this proposal. When the attack on libraries began about a year and a half ago, it started with the challenge of five titles, all LGBTQ or African American stories. When that didn't work, the tactic shifted to another more comprehensive list, a list provided by a national political action committee. When that didn't work, the attack shifted to frame it as a parental rights issue. It had some traction because we actually all agree with that. We agree that parents absolutely have the right to monitor what their children read. Because of that agreement, with an assist from Senate Bill 656, we developed the opt-out policy that someone else has already spoken about. This provides every parent with the opportunity to monitor every book their child checks out from the library. The forms are widely available, they're simple, they stay in a child's record and travel with them as they go through school. Some of you have actually visited school libraries and seen the effectiveness of that policy in action. So why isn't that enough? If the real goal here is to protect a parent's right to monitor what their children read, why isn't that enough? You see, we were all led to believe that there was widespread support for an opt-out policy, that hundreds of parents were potentially concerned about library materials. As someone else already told you, we have 65,500 students and only 12 opt-out policies have been turned in. That means 65,488 students have parents who don't think the library books are the problem. Every time you push for greater restrictions on the freedom to read, every time you spend countless staff, school board, and community hours on a problem that doesn't exist, you are not, in fact, representing a majority of parents. So why the push? What is the real goal 30 here? seconds. This policy does not address any of the real problems we have in the school division, problems you were elected to help us solve. This doesn't fix an outdated facility, calm the insanity of the four by four, reduce the paperwork on special ed teachers, and it certainly doesn't help with recruitment and retention. All this does is make a school librarian's job almost impossible to do, but maybe that was the real goal. Our next speaker is Carolyn Rye, then Laura Pyle, then Wendy Nelson. Welcome. Good evening, Chair Riggs, Vice Chair Weems, distinguished school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm here tonight to celebrate the official start of Virginia Beach's inaugural VHSL lacrosse season. Almost one month ago, on March 28th, I was present to see the girls and boys teams of Ocean Lakes and Kempsville High Schools square off at the Virginia Beach Sportsplex. And for the record, the first goals of this, for, for this new sport in each game were scored by the Dolphins of Ocean Lakes. I remain grateful to those of you serving with me on November 21st of 2021 when unanimous school board support was recorded. Once again, thank you, Mrs. Riggs, Mrs. Weems, Mrs. Melnick, Mrs. Anderson, Mrs. Manning, 
Ms. Owens, Mrs. Franklin, and former colleagues Dottie Holtz, Sharon Felton, and Laura Hughes. Former Chair Dan Edwards also belongs in this recognized group for his early and influential support. Virginia Beach is the first public school district in Southampton Roads to sponsor VHSL lacrosse, and it is our new, first new varsity level sport in 25 years. For the hundreds who worked tire tirelessly over many years to make this a reality, their goal is now realized. I applaud the sustained commitment of the local Hampton Roads lacrosse community over these past few decades and on a more focused basis the last six years. This passionate group of parents, players, and coaches were provided a roadmap in 2016 and ran with it. The division effort required to field 22 new varsity teams out of the gate cannot be overstated. Critical considerations included gauging level of interest across the division, financial cost, field capacity, and coach availability. The support of you, Dr. Spence, and your administrative team, in particular, Chief of Staff Don Robertson and division-wide athletic coordinators David Rhodes, Jim Long, and John Cosimano, was critical to this outcome. Of equal importance seconds. was the league's new school level part was the league's school level partnership with our high school principals and student activity coordinators, some of whom have since retired. So I urge each of you and the public to come cheer on our student athletes. Regular season games continue through mid-May and region playoffs begin Friday, May 19th. For team schedules, refer to beachdistrictva.org. And Thank that is you. time. Our next speaker is Laura Pyle, then Wendy Nelson. Speaker number nine had to cancel, and then it will be Sharon Wood. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. I'm the parent of two VBCPS students, one fourth grader and one sixth grader at Old Donation School. Both of my kids are avid readers, and let's just say those apples don't fall far from this tree. I love books, and I'm a frequent volunteer at the ODS Library. I want to give a huge kudos to the librarians at ODS. Mrs. German and Mrs. Wood have created a warm, welcoming environment that encourages students to love learning and to love reading. Our school librarians do so much, always with a smile, grace, and compassion. If you haven't visited the ODS library, I encourage you to do so. It's truly an amazing place. I could go on and on about the wonderful things I see, but I'd run out of time. I do want to share one of my favorite experiences, though. I absolutely love overhearing a student in the stacks find a book and quietly yelling, yes, and literally skip to the checkout. No, you're not supposed to skip in the library, but I never have the heart to stop them. The joy of reading and the love of learning is just magical to see. I fear that policy 665 would curtail the library's current activities and block student access to too many books unnecessarily. Removing sexually explicit content from elementary libraries can sound like a good idea, but the policy is unclear. Per the definitions, books with, quote, any description of or visual representation depicting a lewd exhibition of nudity would need to go. Nudity is defined in the policy by referencing the Virginia Code, but lewd isn't. So what's lewd and who decides it? Without further guidance, what meets the standard? Is an image of a nude statue in an art book lewd? Will any art books remain for elementary students? Is a description of a Native American wearing a loincloth lewd? Will many history books remain for elementary students? Is Iggy Peck architect lewd because his bum is visible while building a tower in only an hour with nothing but diapers and glue? And how will this identification process happen? The policy doesn't say. If librarians must re-review all elementary books by the beginning of next year, entire school libraries would effectively close for the rest of the year, and even then it would be an impossible task. Furthermore, as other people have stated, effective systems currently exist for selecting appropriate library materials and restricting access to particular books at a parent's request and challenging books at the district level. 
This policy would effectively challenge every elementary book for every elementary student rather than allowing parents to make those decisions. Please take into consideration these existing less restrictive systems in deciding whether new additions to the policy are necessary. Please consult librarians and teachers about how this policy would affect current library programs. In a time- And that is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wendy Nelson, Sharon Wood, and then Ronald Kaufman. Well, welcome. Good evening, I'm a high school library media specialist in Virginia Beach, as well as a mother of two recent graduates. Tonight, I will share some data to illustrate the incredible burden of time that will be placed on high school librarians to read and evaluate our collections so that we can create a list of sexually explicit materials for you. You and the taxpayers will be shocked to learn of the fiscal cost of this endeavor. Mrs. Anderson visited our school recently, and she asked us how long our library might need to be shut down while we created a list of sexually explicit materials. I calculated that if I read 50 pages an hour, every hour of my workday, until I have read the almost 10,000 books in our library, it would take 43 years. Fortunately, thanks to Virginia state law, which codifies the well-documented educational value of school libraries, every school of our size has two librarians, so that time would be cut to 21 and a half years if we do nothing else but read, neglecting our instructional duties, relationship building with students, clubs and enrichment activities, and facility management. But good news, we have 24 high school librarians in the district who can help us out. So with an estimated 13,000 unique book titles in high schools, that's 443 days for each of us. So if none of us do any other part of our jobs, and remember, we are instructional staff, not full-time book readers, it would take two and a half years to make this list for you. But I know, of course, that as of now, we'd only have to put new books we order on this list. So this may sound more reasonable. However, we add at least 500 new titles each year. At about 3,000 hours of reading, each of the 24 of us would need to read for 17 days every year to keep this list updated. At our average base salary of $55,000, this will cost the school system $120,000 annually in opportunity cost, the lost opportunity to do anything else during the time we spend on full-time reading. And that doesn't even include the cost of the time to be spent by elementary and middle school library media specialists. Perhaps you still think it's worth it, the parents want this, you say. But if that's true, again, why are there only 12 students in our district of more than 65,000 students whose parents took advantage of the opt-out option that already exists using our public searchable library catalogs and a simple form to restrict their child's library book access. Only a couple of these 12 students are in high school. So that means in future years for each one of these couple students at $120,000 plus in high school LMS's time, you're gonna be spending more than $50,000 of taxpayer money annually per student. That is absolutely nuts. So I ask each of you to please vote no against this colossal waste of time and taxpayer money. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Wood, Ronald Kaufman, and then Karen Gilbert. Welcome. Hello, my name is Sharon Wood. I have been with the system since 2004 and have taught at several schools in the district and am now a library media specialist at Old Donation School. I have three children, one who has graduated from BB schools and two who currently attend middle school. I would like to start by thanking school board members Mrs. R Ms. Riggs and Mr. Callan who responded to our invitation to come and read to the students at my school later this week. I look forward to showing you the amazing things that our library is doing to help facilitate students academic and social emotional learning. I have been an avid viewer of school board meetings for the last few years and have had the opportunity to see the hard and stressful work that is done by members of the school board and the district. The latest policy changes regarding library materials is what has propelled me to speak tonight. The suggested changes to school board policy 6-65 will greatly affect all VB school librarians and limit them from successfully and fully performing their jobs. Virginia Beach librarians already spend an enormous part of our time evaluating and curating our collection for age appropriateness and interest level. Before adding to our collection, we make sure that books aligned to our city and state standards of learning incorporate accurate and authentic factual content, meet the needs of students and faculty, take into consideration diverse interests, abilities, backgrounds, reading levels, maturity levels, learning styles, home languages, and students' extracurricular interests. 
And we also find and read professional reviews that give us information on content, theme, interest, relevance, accuracy, and age appropriateness. The new policy changes that are being suggested will mean that instead of doing all of our other jobs and duties that we perform on a, a daily basis, the library staff will instead be reevaluating, for instance, in my school, over 11,000 elementary school books to ensure the new policy components are met. That will not take a week, a month, or even a year. It will take many years. This means a loss of checking out for students until books have been reviewed. This means a drastic decline of reading and being involved in research skills. This means the loss of collaboration between librarians and other staff members. This means a loss of makerspace for students. This means a loss of professional development workshop for teachers. This means the loss of special library events such as book tastings, guest readers, book fairs, and so much more. This also means a loss of collaboration with community members. This means the loss of so many other vital activities. Are you willing to sacrifice the incredible work that library media specialists do every day? Our collections are already a result of a stringent curation process. Involved and interested parents 30 seconds. already have access to forms. Involved and interested parents already have the entire collection at their fingertips. Involved and interested parents are already included and encouraged to be a partner with us. There is already an easily maneuvered challenge process when parents do not approve of a book. By passing the policy in the suggested format, you are only creating unnecessary busy work for library media specialists that will take time away from our main goals of being educators, information specialists, program administrators, collaborators, coaches, and trusted individuals. I urge the members of the board that is time. to send the policy back to committee. Our next speaker is Ronald Kaufman, then Karen Gilbert, then Charlene Olson. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Ronald Kaufman, and I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not a librarian or media specialist, but I certainly admire the work that they do. And I would like to thank the, uh, the board for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's interesting that uh, one of the books that's uh, cited under policy 6-65 is the Diary of Anne Frank. Since just last week, we observed Yom HaShoah, which is the Holocaust Memorial Day. Today, I'm deeply concerned about the process and the vague definition of what is considered sexually explicit in books such as the Diary of Anne Frank. It appears that this policy was implemented without transparency and without representation from our diverse community and other community stakeholders. Until this is accomplished, this, this policy should be either voted down or removed from the agenda. And if this policy is adopted, where does it stop? After all, the Torah, the Quran, and the Christian Bible could be construed as, cont as containing sexually explicit passages. What other great works of literature are going to be included in this policy in the future? Reading books such as The Diary of Anne Frank, The Grapes of Wrath, and others bring history to life, as opposed to reading a history textbook. They generate serious discussions among students and faculty and removing such books from our curriculum would mean depriving our students of the opportunity to engage with important issues, both past and present. It is important to note that the governor supports parental rights. As a fellow citizen, I support parental rights, but I, but I object to, the, uh, to uh, these, these parents who should have the opportunity to meet with their librarian or teacher on an individual basis and come up with alternatives and not deny other students the right to learn from these books. In, <clears throat> in conclusion, I urge the board to reconsider this policy and to involve the community and stakeholders in the process. Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is Karen Gilbert, then Charlene Olson, then Michael Hashimi. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Two things. One, I am in awe of the students who spoke earlier, whose lives are impacted by the policies you all get to decide on. Their words were absolutely amazing. However, I'm Karen Gilbert. I'm a longtime resident of Virginia Beach. My children and grandchildren have or are Virginia public school students. But I'm also a member of the Holocaust Commission, the United Jewish Federation of Tidewater. The commission has invested countless hours 
working with educators, developing programs, seeking to help all people learn about the Holocaust and its effect. The issue of banning or even targeting books is cause for me to rise and ask exactly which one of the Anne Frame diary books does this list include? The original one, the unabridged one, the graphic content one. The author begins her story at an age many of our current eighth and ninth graders are at. I'm sure there are individuals who seek to restrain, restrict, edit, or eliminate subjects and realities through targeting books that make them uncomfortable. And as I learned tonight, wow, a whole 12 families in the city of Virginia Beach have done that. And the list of books is a first step infringing on First Amendment rights and should not be given the opportunity to succeed in limiting or removing books based on a subjective idea developed out of town and perhaps even out of state. <coughs> It's a scary, slippery slope. Who is deciding on titles to be examined? What words are deemed inappropriate? What is it about Anne Frank Diary, whose life was snuffed out by Nazis, that would target this book? Her words matter. Her words should be read by all students in middle or high school. I would also recommend- 30 seconds. School board members and anyone here to read her remarks. Please get additional input into this list. Send this back to committee. Please do not approve by consent at this time. Let the board, teachers, and members of our community evaluate the policy. Banning books, targeting books, bad idea. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlene Olson, then Michael Hashimi, and then Lisa Bertini. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Dr. Spence, and school board members. Thank you for allowing me to speak towards the proposed changes to the library policy. I'm Charlene Olson. I've been a teacher in our school system for 25 years, the last 11 as a librarian or library meter specialist. Since it is National Library Week and School Library Month, I find it ironic that I'm here tonight to discuss censorship and the freedom to read. The revised library policy doesn't sound too bad, but there will be unintended consequences. Unfortunately, reading reviews isn't always enough to assure that nothing slips through the cracks. The issue is that the reviews for books are only skin deep, and they can't possibly cover everything. Most reviews are only a paragraph or two, and they give a brief synopsis of the book, and they usually mention key things, but because they are short, they can't cover everything. If this policy is passed in order to protect ourselves and abide by the school board policies, librarians would have to read every book cover to cover before putting it on the shelf to ensure that there isn't any explicit material in them. This past year, I acquired almost 400 books from my middle school library. That means the other librarian and I would have to read an average of a book a day. I'm a fast reader, but I'm not that fast. I oppose the changes to the library policy because they will place an undue hardship on the library staff and it will prevent us from doing one of the most important aspects of our jobs, which is collaborating with teachers and supporting student learning. I collaborate with teachers and offer some amazing lessons from breakout boxes on American Revolution, World War II, team building and reading comprehension to goose chase scavenger hunts. And if you've never witnessed one of those, I invite you to come to our next one to information literacy and research lessons on topics such as the Holocaust and genocide, careers, and the Harlem Renaissance. I also assist with small group remediation in preparation for the English SOL testing. As you can see, we are not the librarians that you grew up with, and librarians throughout Virginia Beach City Public Schools are doing amazing things. But these lessons will come to a screeching halt if the new library policy is implemented. Instead of collaborating with teachers and assisting students, we will spend our days in the building reading books to ensure that any, excuse me, that any that contain explicit material are added to the proposed sexually explicit materials list. 
Reading each and every seconds. book is the only way to ensure that the proposed policy is adhered to. Is this the best use of our time and talent? I won't have the time to collaborate with teachers, much less teach. Under this policy, I would be spending all day reading books. I won't have time to collaborate, coach teachers, teach lessons, recommend books to students and staff, won't have time to run announcements, substitute in classrooms, attend PLC meetings, purchase materials, run the 3D printer, monitor makers, mace activities, or the various tasks I do in a day. I won't have anything to, time to do anything but read, and I love reading. And that this is, is the time. Best use of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Hashimi, then Lisa Bertini, then Adam Howell Smith. Welcome. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, I find it quite disingenuous, some of these books that have been put on these uh, targeted for opting out for uh, students uh, with part of the curriculum, specifically 1984 and the Diary of Anne Frank. Um, these are infamous works that I believe virtually everyone here has probably read growing up, going to school. And so if there really were problems, um, I think we would see them in our country, right, uh, over these decades. And, you know, I believe that there isn't a bunch of sexual deviance in here because you read these books, right? So also, if these, these are such infamous works, and if these, um, you know, lines in the literature were so offensive and did so much harm, then why were we shocked to find them, or the people who were reviewing this, shocked to find all the sexual content? If it made such an impact, or we believe it's gonna make such an impact, why is it not the overall content that or the overall message in these books that we gather once we read them? I would argue that the overall content is trying to be censored, not these lines in the book. So, um, I, I, you know, I think people, some of these 12 that have said that they want to, um, you know, opt their kids out, um, I believe, you know, if we can teach kids how to handle firearms, at middle school and high school age, I think having them learn about words in a book should not be that hard. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Bertini, then Adam Howell Smith, then John Daniel Torres Arvero. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm Lisa Bertini. Um, two of my daughters, now much older, went to Virginia Beach Public Schools through eighth grade. And we love our librarians, and we love our transgender students. Thank you so much for being so brilliant up here. After graduating law school at William & Mary, 1987, I decided to choose discrimination law. Um, and the reason I chose that and practiced it for 35 years now is because I read a book when I was 14 called To Kill a Mockingbird, and it really changed my life. My dad and I read it, it was assigned at school, and it wasn't despite the raw emotional scenes and extreme racism in the book, it was because of that that I fell in love with it, and it marked my soul. Also, my elder daughter read The House on Mango Street when she was in ninth grade, and I remember her running down the stairs from upstairs, because I really wasn't checking what she was reading because I was working full time and depending on librarians, which they did a great job, um, and she was absolutely excited and reading to me, dancing with magical metaphors that she was reciting. She learned about empathy and what the Mexican-American people had to give up to live here. That book changed her. It changed her for good. Today, we talk about the diary of Anne Frank because as the other speaker expressed, it was Yom HaShoah last week. And that's, for a lot of we non-Jews, that was our first foray, really, into the, one of the most horrific historical abyss ever, the Holocaust. Our survivors are so very few. I work with the Holocaust Commission on the Speakers Bureau. There's many of great women here tonight on that bureau. We go to your schools. We go to the middle schools. I was at Great Neck last week and Princess Anne. We talk to the seventh graders. We show them films of the survivors who aren't with us anymore. They're real films. They're terrifying. They're scary. They have naked dead people in them because that's actually what happened in the Holocaust. It was brutal. And you know what? So was war, hate, fascism, if we're allowed to use that word, I forget. Difficult images are necessary to digest while growing up. 30 seconds. And these kids are amazing. 
They understand Anne Frank because she was their age. We cannot disempower this next generation from coming to terms with complex thinking, reasoning, and empathy. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Adam Howell-Smith, then John Daniel Avero, and then Courtney Porter. Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Adam Hell Smith. Um, I am a research and audit professional, a union leader, and most importantly, a parent of a child who will be starting in Virginia Beach schools in the coming years. Uh, I'm here to voice my strong opposition to the proposal on censorship in school libraries, but I have to stop and say that as a comparatively elder member of the queer community, I'm in awe of the students who came here to speak today, and I add my voice to their own. Um, I'd like to address the policy, which as I see it, consists of two parts. So first, we should state the obvious, which is that no one on this board actually believes that children today in our schools and elementary schools have access to sexually explicit material in the libraries. That stretches the limits of credibility. This proposal is designed to appear reasonable and inarguable. Its proponents will claim with faux indignation that opponents of this policy are in favor of children having access to such material, which is frankly ridiculous. But make no mistake, it is a solution in search of an imaginary problem. This doesn't mean that it doesn't serve a useful purpose. The true intention of this proposal is to establish a beachhead in the culture wars. It establishes a precedent and a process for banning media at first, imaginary objectionable material, and then weaponizing that process for future battles. Next will be objections to books in elementary schools which address LGBTQ families like my own. Then, age-appropriate but honest depictions of the realities of slavery and the Holocaust. Then, in six months, we'll see a proposal to expand it to high schools. It's the thin end of the wedge, the first steps down a slippery slope toward the ultimate goal of cleansing the library of materials that don't comport with the sponsor's worldview. The second part is more clever, and perhaps the sponsors are patting themselves on the back for that. They'll claim that when it comes to high school students, no one is seeking to ban books outright, but rather to simply empower parents with greater control over what media their children consume. But the fact of the matter is that this type of literary redlining has an equally dangerous and corrosive effect. It silences dissenting voices behind a locked glass case labeled dangerous books, books which are dangerous precisely because they express narratives and experiences which speak to the lives which the sponsors wish to erase. It's wonderful when parents are engaged with their teens' lives and interests, but all too often LGBTQ, LGBTQ youth who will be the targets of this policy fear not a, a bully that's their classmate, the bully they fear that the most is in the home. By placing the stories of people like them under lock and key, accessible only with permission slip, you're cutting them off from a literal lifeline. You should see this policy for what it is. It is performative, poisonous politics. It is un-American, it's ill-conceived, and I urge you to reject it. And that is time. Our next speaker is John Daniel Avero and then Courtney Porter. John Daniel Avero. We'll move on to Courtney Porter and then Beth Labar. Welcome. Good evening, my name is Courtney Porter and I'm a proud high school library media specialist. I'm also a community member, a graduate, go FC. But most importantly, I am a parent and I'm here tonight to speak to you as a parent to address the school library policy changes that will strip me and the vast majority of parents in our system of our parental rights. First, let's live in the factual data-driven world for a moment. And last year, when book challenges became a trend for a very small minority, less than one-tenth of our library materials were challenged. This is a really small group of people who have concerns with school library books. As a result, schools put opt-out forms on their websites and link them in the public library catalog, Destiny, so parents could restrict library materials for their children. Considering the emphasis that was placed on parental rights con concerning books and how much time was spent listening to those who demanded that the so-called porn peddling stop, can you guess how many parents exercised that right to opt their children out? I bet you can. It's been said about 10 times tonight. 12. 12 out of 65,500 students in the district have an opt-out form on file 
With the proposed policy, those parents will maintain their parental rights while the rest of us parents will lose ours. So is it really about parents' rights or is it just certain parents' rights? For elementary schools, books deemed sexually explicit as per school board policy will not be on a restricted list. However, they will be removed entirely. So popular books like No David, Are You There God, It's Me Margaret, Captain Underpants, and many more will be removed from elementary libraries. Who does this affect? The children, the children whose parents don't have money to purchase books or who cannot access the public library, lose their rights to read these award-winning books. Parents who are invested in their children's education and speak to their children about their reading choices will lose their rights. This policy is being proposed because of 0.02% of the parents in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, not the majority. In secondary schools, books will be evaluated for sexually explicit content and placed on a restricted list. Based on the terminology in the proposed policy, we would have to identify the Bible, all of Shakespeare, a vast number of classics, most if not all science and anatomy books, art books, so on and so on. You get the point. Who does this affect? Again, children whose parents don't have resources to supply their children with library books at home and who cannot access the public library. Again, parents who want their children to have access to the school library collection, which seconds. is appropriately and professionally curated by trained and degreed school librarians. Teachers who devote their lives to promote literacy and foster a lifelong love of reading in their students. Please, if you value children's literacy and the rights of all parents to have input into their children's education, please vote against proposed policy 665. Our next speaker is Beth Labar. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Beth Labar. I've come to talk to you today about the same thing I've been coming to talk to you about for the last six or seven months. Uh, the proposed 2022 model policies pertaining to transgender students. Transgender people have existed since humans have existed. Gender itself is a social construct. It is only logical with all the possible variations in self-expression that some people don't fit neatly into little boxes especially when the guidelines of those boxes were created by humans. Honestly, I was really hoping that this speech would not be necessary tonight. I had hoped that the board would have made a decision to support the entire student body by putting systems in place that affirm gender, gender identities of transgender youth, as we know this is considered best practice in the fields of medicine, education, psychology, and social work. That hasn't happened yet, but I remain hopeful. These students and others have attended school board meetings since mid-September to let you know how important this issue is to them and their peers. They have been poised, respectful, and articulate. They have spoken eloquently and sincerely about a subject that can be tough to tackle for people who are twice their chronological age. Their message has been one of acceptance equality and love. All of those are characteristics that we need more of in this world. Thank you. Okay, um, it is now two minutes of eight. Um, we have 10 left discussing this topic. This is up to us if we want to continue <sighs> Um, to listen or if we want to let us do the information and then come back for 13. Yes. So um, when the bylaw was changed to pause public comment at 8 p.m., the intention of that appeared to be to ensure that our staff would be able to present and go home and um, 10 speakers is another 30 minutes, so um, I personally feel as though we should go on with our presentations and then go back um, to public comment for that reason. Thank you. Do I have head shaking there? Okay. So we'll go ahead on with our agenda. We will come back after um, information, which is number 12. We'll come back to our public comments and go as quickly as we possibly can. 
So we're gonna start with um, the interim financial statements for March 2023. Welcome Mr. Dan Hopkins, our Director of Business Services. Good evening. Uh, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chairwoman Weems, School Board members, Dr. Spence. As of March 31st, the overall revenue trend remains acceptable at this point in the fiscal year as illustrated in the first graph. The General Assembly agreed on a budget and we have an updated calc tool as of April 7th. The projected budget is about $1.4 million higher than our current budget. The major changes are in basic aid, with an, which is decreasing $9.3 million, but our sales tax is increasing $10.7 million. Federal revenues are showing a favorable trend at this point in the fiscal year. We have received federal uh, impact aid payments of approximately $14 million through the month of March. Other sources of revenue through the month of March are favorable at this point in the fiscal year. This is mainly due to the stop arm enforcement program and the sale of capital assets. The next graph shows that the sales tax receipts are at an acceptable level. Year to date through March, we are approximately $3.2 million higher than the same time last year. April sales tax is coming in about $389,000 below the month of April last year. And the last graph shows that the expenditures and encumbrances trend continues to remain acceptable at this point in the fiscal year. At this time, I'll take any questions. As I see none, thank you very much. Thank you. So we're on B, the Policy Review Committee recommendations. Welcome Mrs. Kamala Linetti, our school board attorney. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, School Board Members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Kamala Linetti, the School Board Attorney. On behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I will be making uh, recommendations from the Policy Review Committee's April 5th, 2023 meeting. There are only six policies that we'll be looking at tonight under information. The first one is policy 2-3, which falls under our administration section, and this has to do with consultants, and this is when the school division or the school board hires a consultant. The recommendation from the policy review committee is to add another sentence to the first paragraph, and that sentence would read, the superintendent designee will provide information in the superintendent's monthly report to the school board regarding consultants hired by the school division to conduct work at the division level for services totaling more than $10,000. There are no other recommended changes to this policy. Are there any questions on policy 2-3? I'm sorry, Dr. Spence has a question. Spence. Um, I just want to clarify that that's not the monthly reports that are provided here in the session. It's the written reports that are re provided to the board, correct? Dr. Roberts, I mean, I believe I'm guess. Yeah, Dr. Roberts, he says yes, that's correct. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Moving on to policy 3-68, this is employee lactation support policy. This currently is located in our business and non-instructional operations section. When initially was adopted as a change in the law in 2014 that required that we provide employee lactation support, it, we put it under the section that had to do with all buildings. The recommendation from the Human Resources Department was to change over the policy and put it in Section 4, feeling that employees would go and look in Section 4 under the personnel matters rather than in the business section. So therefore, at this time, we're going to recommend repealing bylaw, or bylaw policy 368, litation support. You're going to see that come back up. As it'll be readopted under 4-29, which will come up later on. Are there any questions upon the recommendation to repeal policy 368? Moving on to policy 429, 
Section four has to deal with our personnel section. Again, on the recommendation of human resources, they asked us to move the employee lactation support under policy four, uh, under section four with personnel. And then you would then be adopting policy 429. Again, this is the former 368 with slight changes to that. Again, this would allow for a work location for an individual employee who was expressing breast milk. And there are certain conditions that are added to that, I suppose the time off and the location where in the building that would take place. And we're recommending that you readopt this policy as policy 429. Are there any questions on policy 429? Hearing no questions. Uh, I I, can I just make a comment? Madam Chair? Yes. Um, yes I, wa I want to thank um, Ms. Brown. She asked us to look more deeply into this, and it, it, this will actually expand. It had said in there that employees would have a reasonable break for nursing for one year, and Ms. Brown suggested that we change it to two years for those who may still be nursing um, to that point. And so I just want to highlight this and also really acknowledge the work that our Human Resources Department has done on a lot of these HR policies to make it more friendly for our employees, to make it easier to find. Um, HR has been very supportive in these changes and, and making things um, better for our employees. And thank you to Ms. Brown for recognizing that as well. Thank you. Hearing no further questions on 429, we'll move on to 434. 434 originally is going to be changed, was a different policy. Human Resources looked at some of the other policies that you've seen in prior meetings and felt like some of the information that was covered under personal protection was incorporated into policies that you've already looked at or that will be coming up to you. So their suggestion is that we go ahead and amend policy 434 would now be response to allegations against the staff of assault or other acts. So this is when an individual is either an employee is accused of a crime, might be under investigation, or a child protective services matter. So you'll see significant amendments to this particular policy. In, in particular, what will need to happen is that we're going to have an individual who's accused of a civil or criminal proceedings brought against an employee alleging that they've committed assault or similar act in their employment, they now need to give information concerning that incident. They also have to keep the school board updated on the status of what's going on. This also allows them to come back, which has been our practice, to seek reimbursement for their legal costs in defending a criminal charge uh, in their capacity as a school board member. Also, if they need to expunge their criminal record upon a finding of a dismissal of the case or a null process of the case, and that's just spelled out in here. The rest of the information is being taken taken out because it is incorporated into other policies. So this will be a modified policy, and the school board is going to be um, asked to amend policy 434 to be just response to allegations against staff of assault or other acts. Are there any questions about policy 434? Ms. Owens. Thank you. I just had a couple. Um, the top part that's being taken out, uh, it's because this uh, issue is covered in a different policy. Can you tell me where I can find where it's covered? I don't have that on me at the moment. I'll be happy to get that for you. What they felt was the confusion was, this is what happens when you feel you've been assaulted or you need some protection versus what an employee has to do if an employee is under a charge. So they split them out so it would be a little bit clearer on that. And I will get the policy, the current policy that covers what you're asking about. OK, I had one other question. Uh, my understanding from your explanation is that this is uh, telling employees that they are part of this is they need to keep the superintendent or HR or the board uh, aware of when they have been charged with something. But I am not seeing in this policy where it says that they have to notify somebody or giving any time frame of when they have to notify after being informed that they are charged. Ms. Owens, if you take a look at, on the consent agenda on policy 4-5, it will be criminal or, or child protective services charges findings. That policy more specifically spells out what happens there. We, pro we covered that last time, so you would be approving that under the consent agenda. So this one is just for after the investigation is completed, if they had not been found uh, liable or founded of wrongdoing this is where they can come to get the support from the board. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Are there any further questions on policy 434? Okay. The next one is 4519. 
similar to what we saw on the employee lactation policy on there. When we took it out of Section 3, it was originally put into Section 3 because Section 3 covers all of our buildings, so it would have covered both employees and students. When the recommendation was to put a specific one on employee lactation, it was necessary for us to create a policy that specifically applied to students because we have students that may be in the situation. So we already had an existing policy, 519, that dealt with the rights of pregnant and parenting students, so we're just amending it out to include lactation support here. So well, now the title will read, Pregnant and parenting students and lactation support will put a section A, which talks about the general rights of pregnant and parenting students from participating in education and extracurricular activities. So there's a bit title there, but no change to that section. We're then recommending that to be our section B for lactation support and the rights for parents who are in need lactation support in the educational setting to come. So that will cover our students here. So similar to what you saw with employees, is now we'll have protection for students that have lactation need, has lactation support needs. So so again, just matching your prior policy on employees. Any questions on policy 519? Hearing no questions on policy 519, we will move on to proposed policy 665, library media center slash professional libraries. This would be a recommendation to adopt this policy with significant changes to it. Again, this is um, policy 665. Currently, Section A would not be recommended to be changed. There would be a recommendation to add a Section B for definitions. The first definition, one, would be the sexually explicit content. Explanation is there. This is similar, almost identical to what you see in Policy 611, which you were required to adopt last year, having to do with sexually explicit content in instructional materials. So it's the same definitions you find there. Again, there's a definition of parents or parenting Section 2. And section three defines library materials, spelling out what library materials are presented to um, both state code and um, some recommendations from PRC. You would then add a proposed section C, which is selection of library materials. Subsection one would be selection of new materials. And I'll state that a clear procedure for selecting new library materials must adhere to the following standards. And there would be subsection small a, elementary schools. The library materials selected for elementary schools, whether free materials or purchased materials, will not contain sexually explicit content. You'd have a section B, small b, middle and high schools. Library materials selected for middle and high schools, whether free materials or purchased materials that contain sexually explicit content must be added to a list called sexually explicit materials and the list must be posted on the school website under the library section. Parents will be notified annually about the existence and location of the list and will be notified about the ability to opt their child out of any sexually explicit library materials utilizing an opt-out form that will also be included in the notification and made available on the school website. There would be a subsection two, so there'd be C2, which would be existing library materials. So the intent is that per the for section um, one has to do with when you're getting new materials. Section two would be materials that are already in our libraries. And again, you would break it out into subsection 2A, which would be elementary schools. Any existing library materials that contain sexually explicit content found in elementary schools must be removed by the beginning of the 2023-24 school year. Then you would have section B, which will be middle and high schools. Any existing library material that contains sexually explicit content found in middle or high schools will be reviewed upon a challenge brought forth by a parent or adult student. If the library material is deemed to contain sexually explicit content through the challenge process, it shall be, brought on, it shall be put on the list called sexually explicit library materials. Then we would have subsection D, which would read identification of library materials with sexually explicit content. And I'll allow subsection one, the superintendent or designee shall establish a process for identifying library materials with sexually explicit content refer referenced in sections A, B, or C of this policy. And subsection two would be the superintendent or designee will develop a process for parents or adult students to challenge library materials. Then we would renumber the section E, material, uh, and equipment and F professional what would formally C would be professional libraries and just some updating to the uh, legal references at that point. That right now are the proposed amendments to policy 665. Are there any questions that I or the PRC can answer for you at this time? Ms. Milnick. So Mrs. Linetti, that's probably the longest policy we have on, on the books. It's also 
state code or law that's it's already it's already codified so my question first is do we need this policy and i would assume the answer is no because there's already a law that governs this um I can repeat everything our library media specialist said this evening about the ambiguity and the subjectivity, how the definition narrows as you read the law. Um, they're concerned about um, perhaps a backdoor entrance to um, public shaming of our library media specialists. There's already precedence for that. Um, they've talked this evening about parental rights and the 12 parents that have actually put in the um, paperwork. I think that's a fabulous process. It, it, it works. Um, and I don't think this needs to be touched. Um, there are a lot of things that I am concerned about, a lot of trickle-down effects, if you will. Um, I mean, where is this leading us? Will this, I mean, is the ultimate goal to shut down our libraries? Evidently, that's what the state superintendent would like anyway. Um, and the answer to one of our speakers is yes. Actually, 16 of our textbooks fall under the definition of this code. Um, and what does that mean for our students studying anatomy and physiology? What does that mean? Do we need to get rid of our um, Health Science Academy now? Is that where we are? Um, with everything we've heard this evening and with the speakers that still have to speak, um, I actually am requesting that the policy committee strike this, this policy, um, and we rely on, sadly, the already ambiguous code that is going to govern our um, our, our books, which is very sad. Ms. Williams. Um, yes, Chair Riggs, I am requesting, if they are willing, perhaps the people on the committee, the PRC committee, um, get a chance to kind of explain, because, I mean, like, I just heard that from librarians, which I agree, you, you cannot read every book in your library, but then the policy says only if books are challenged do you review them, and then it goes through the process. So, you know, there's, there's just a lot of, a, a lot of um, passion around this subject, so I would kind of like to hear from the people on the policy um, committee that wrote this of, of why and, and talk about the, the code versus law versus why elementary, why middle, just kind of give an overview. Um, that would be very helpful to me instead of us all pinging questions. I would like to hear from them first and then I can um, organize my questions. Thank you. Okay, so Ms. Anderson, and then did you raise your hand, Ms. Ms. Manning? So, um, during the committee meeting, I raised the question of would librarians be required to read every book? And my fear is that our librarians want to be compliant. They, they obviously, they don't want someone to walk in and accidentally pick up a book and find that, oh my goodness, this one slipped through. So because of that, they are probably going to have to read through their books to make sure that they are 100% compliant. I raised this question in the policy committee and was told, no, no, they won't have to read every single book. Well, that's not what librarians are going to do. They're going to want to be compliant, and that was my fear all along. I went along and voted for this to come forward knowing that we were going to discuss it. Just because I vote for something to move forward, by the way, in the policy committee doesn't mean that I'm agreeing with it, as one of our speakers tonight suggested. It means that I'm willing to bring this forward for the board to discuss. 
because we, we have many, I still have many questions over this. And I also, also believe strongly that the, the procedures that we have in place for parents to um, uh, put forward, the, fill out the forms and fill out whatever it is they want to restrict their ch students on, parents have the right to do that. Um, I feel that what we have in place is adequate and, and takes care of everything that the state has asked us to do, and I honestly don't, do not believe that we really need this, even though I did vote to move it forward. Um, I just, I don't feel that this is necessary, and it will cause our librarians to um, read an uh, ungodly number of books just to make sure that they are being compliant with our, our procedures and our rules. So that's my take on it. And Thank you. I'm not in favor of, the, of this particular um, policy as it's written. Ms. Manning. So I'll answer Ms. Weems' question, and then if you can put me in the queue, because I have some other comments. Um, but I just wanted to answer Ms. Weems' question. Um, so as the, as the policy reads, um, you know, we did ask the question um, regarding elementary schools because it does say that sexually explicit content must be removed, um, which it doesn't say that at the middle and high school level. And so um, it was requested that we delay it until 23-24, and we agreed to do that. And we were told by administration that librarians review all of the materials in their libraries in the summertime anyway. Um, I've also been told that librarians know what's in the libraries. Um, so this also says sexually explicit content that is found in the middle or high schools. There's no requirement for uh, a middle and high school librarian to read and go through every single book. But it's my understanding it's a, it's a requirement of their job to know what's in the libraries. Um, so that itself wasn't really anything di that's different um, because I've been told that they're supposed to already know what's there. Um, and does that, did that answer your question, Ms. Weems, regarding, did, did I miss any part of your question? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to hear from y'all of, of why this policy is written or this, and, and you know, the why. The why, okay. Yeah, just kind of the why, because I think we need to hear from y'all first before we ask yeah. intelligent okay, well, questions. Okay, well, I'm happy to expand on that. Um, so, as a parent, you know, I began hearing from other school district that they had districts that they had sexually explicit policies or sexually explicit materials in their libraries, and I was like, well, surely we don't have that in Virginia Beach. I've always valued our libraries and really, really loved and enjoyed going there with my kids when they were little. And so I was like, surely there aren't any explicit books in our school library. So I started looking as a parent at what was in my son's school library. And I found a book series called Saga, Saga book series that has since been removed um, by the superintendent. Um, it had extremely graphic sexual content in it. Um, and if anyone is watching or has young children right now, you may want to go ahead and take them out of the room if you're watching online because what I'm gonna be talking about isn't um, appropriate. Um, but they, there were graphic sexual pictures of people having anal sex and orgies and um, things that I would have never ever imagined would be in our schools anywhere. And if a student brought it to school would probably get expelled for the content that was in it. And that really opened my eyes because not only was I a parent, I was a school board member too and still had no idea that this was in our schools. And I started doing some more diving and, and I've spent hundreds if not thousands of hours reviewing what's in our school libraries. Um, we have books, um, The uh, Handmaid's Tale, the graphic novel. Um, we have one of those, I've got a picture of it here. Um, there's a picture of a naked woman eating out of a dog bowl on a chain. Um, another woman is bound with a gun in her mouth. Another woman is laying naked on the floor with her breast showing. Another man is raping a woman. This book is still in two of our high schools. 
Um, so the idea that only 12 people have filled out one of those forms, it's because parents don't know. If I as a school board member didn't know and a parent, how are parents gonna know what's in those school libraries? I had no idea that these hundreds of very sexually explicit books, and, and I could go on and on forever. Um, and they're in middle schools as well. Um, the only ones that I've found in elementary schools were e-books that were young adult, very inappropriate books that were in our elementary schools. They are since no longer there since I've discovered them. Um, but if I, as a school board member, didn't know, how do, how do you know to challenge something that you don't even know is there? So we simply want an awareness around what is in our school libraries in middle and high schools. Sexually explicit book can come through, that's fine. It can be in there for parents who want their children to have it, but it's gonna need to go on a list and that is gonna have to be on a website and parents will have to be notified annually about that website. Um, administration said that basically what's in this policy is what they're already starting to do and what they've started to do over the last several months. So we're just really solidifying it in policy that this is what needs to be done in the future. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Okay, so I'm going to take it by section. Um, there seems to be a lot of misinformation um, and confusion, so I just wanna go over this. Um, so B is definitions, clearly defined. Um, new materials, selection, elementary schools will be free of purchase sexually explicit content. I think we can probably, hopefully, all agree that our elementary school students should not be exposed to sexual content. Um, and if we don't agree, then um, I would be surprised. Um, middle and high schools, um, for new incoming materials, if it's sexually explicit, it would be added to a list. This is providing community with information, a list so that a parent would then be able to have access to all of the information that was identified to meet the legal definition and criteria to make an informed decision on whether or not they want their child to read it. It doesn't take it away from any other student. All it does is put them on a list with an opt-out form. Um, and so existing materials found is a key word, found. This isn't like a, oh, we gotcha. Um, if you see a book and you realize it's sexually explicit and it's in the elementary school level, you remove it. If it's in middle or high school, you add it to the list. If you find it, doesn't mean there's an expectation that you're gonna read every single book cover to cover. Um, a little information on how this arrived. Um, back in our March policy review committee, we had a discussion about this and with some discussion with administrative staff and Ms. Linetti, we all agreed that there would be more conversation with Ms. Linetti's help to come up with language to make sure this isn't violating anyone's rights or infringing on anyone's rights. Um, it is approved for legal sufficiency. Um, so I also think that it's important to note that the wording on this is based on Senate Bill 656, which yes, we have, and it also is a bill that had bipartisan support. There was 52 people in the House that supported it. There was 20 votes in the Senate. That's bipartisan. We're using bipartisan definitions to give parents information. Thank you. If I can have a point of clarification. Under section two, which is existing library materials, they and uh, having section B for the middle high school, it says any existing library materials that contain sexually explicit content found in middle or high schools will be reviewed upon a challenge brought forth by a parent or adult student. So you don't, it's not that the librarians are doing it. Somebody has to then 
find it and then bring forward that challenge. If the library material is deemed to contain sexually explicit content through the challenge process, it shall be placed on the list. You go down the next section, it talks about the superintendent will come forward with a procedure for it. So it's not that the librarians take it and put it on there. Someone who has to be a parent or an adult child has to bring the challenge. We would go through a process. We've yet to develop that, but we have similar processes that we've used in other places. That's how it gets on the list. It's not automatic. There's a process that has to happen. It does not hear, say, at this time that the librarians or in school division staff will do it. It, it says a parent or adult student will, do, will have to bring forward that challenge. Ms. Owens. Thank you. While I, I'm not sure that I uh, see a, a need for the additional uh, policy, I do have a question uh, in regards to, I guess, the definitions. Um, in the beginning, number one, sexually explicit content. And you know, it was said that it it's clear and we would all be in agreement to that, but I don't know that I am in agreement to this definition for elementary school as a parent of an elementary school student in this district. This says uh, nudity as defined in section 18.2390 whatever, and then if you read that section, part of that says any portion thereof below the top of the nipple could use some more clarification here. Are we saying any book that has the Virginia state flag in it will be removed from elementary schools? Because I could see the top, the under, the left, the right, get all the nipple. Is there an age on nipples? Is my child allowed to read a book that has a newborn baby in it wearing a diaper? Is it only okay if the newborn baby is designated as a boy? Is the nipple, under the age four okay. This isn't clear to me. Maybe if there is definition of what lewd nudity is, then we might be in a different place. But from what we have, any drawing, picture, depiction, uh, a book that has a, a cartoon whose pants fall and you see a cartoon butt, it's immediately out, a Bart Simpson whatever comic book is completely inappropriate for a school. Eh. I, I, I need clarity on what some of these actually mean and what we are gonna be taking out uh, in terms of a lot of materials that could be in an elementary school that have a process for challenge to be reviewed if people are concerned. So I, I could use some clarity on what we're doing with flags and other nipples. Dr. Spence. So I think, um, I mean, you're pointing to, you're pointing to a, a, the issue that, um, you know, sort of exists for administ administration and for the educators. Um, and actually it's an opportunity to clarify a little bit because people were talking about um, the diary of Anne Frank. That is on the, that is not in the libraries. It's actually instructional material and it's covered under a different policy. It's not related to this policy. It's related to, um, <clears throat> the, and you mentioned Senate Bill 656, and that required us to adopt a policy, which is 611. So I'll, just, I'll, I'll mention that. But I'll use that. <clears throat> the questions about that, if I could just for a second, as kind of instructive to your, to your question of the problem. The reason that the diary of Anne Frank, or it's, I think it's really the diary of a young girl by Anne Frank, the reason that's in there, um, What's the matter? Can't really? I can hear me. <laughs> you can hear like bouncing back. All right, okay. So the, all right. Uh, so the, the challenge, uh, again, so just to reiterate, this is, uh, like Anne Frank is instructional material. It's not in the, I don't know if it's in the libraries or not, but it is instructional material. We use it in, in middle school, and that's why it, it landed on the list required by Senate Bill 656 mm -hmm. and by our policy 611. And it is the same definition as has been pointed out. And so to your point, Ms. Owens, the, the challenge we have um, is how do we interpret 
that because it's, I mean, if you, if you look at it and you see like, so any description of or picture, photograph, drawing, motion picture, so it's both. If it's just a description of it or if it's a picture or anything else, and there's a lot of stuff that was listed in there, but sexual excitement is listed in there. How do you figure out what is a description of sexual excitement? Most of us can figure out what a description of sexual conduct is, but I suspect there may be people who disagree on, on how that gets interpreted. I think the Diary of a Young Girl is a good example of where we're probably going to find some disagreement. There are some, uh, there is some language in there where she is describing her desire to uh, touch her best friend's breasts, asks her if she can, told she can't, talks about how, how um, you, I think she specifically uses the word excited she gets when she sees nude uh, statues of Venus that bring her to ecstasy. I, somebody's going to say, well, common sense would say that's not what this means. Until you figure out that there's principals getting fired in Florida because there's a picture of the statue of David in a book. And that that group of people were offended by that. And uh, now that was a, I think a charter, maybe non-public, I'm not sure, but regardless, the point is there were a group of parents who were offended by their sixth grade children seeing a picture of the statue of David. So the problem we have, um, and, I, and I appreciate the speakers only, not, not only because, but because it, it did give me a little bit of clarification in terms of how I'm reading the policy, rereading it, um, is, is how do you figure out that and then who's the interpreter? The nudity piece, uh, Ms. Owens, to your point, it actually is specific not to nudity. It is a lewd exhibition of nudity. And so the question becomes, who is interpreting a lewd exhibition? And I think one of the speakers asked the right question. What is lewd? Lewd is in the eye of the beholder. Lewd is what your lewd is and what my lewd is are probably two different things. And there isn't really a, a legal, maybe, definition. There might be a Webster's there definition. There is are there? legal. There are case law that defines lewd yeah. and lascivious. So we nudity. can then figure out, okay, so how does, you know, how do we interpret lewd nudity? So I think the flag's probably safe uh, based on that. But, you know, if it gets challenged, um, we'd have to sort that out. So anyway, I think... Um, just to illuminate kind of the challenge that we have the other just one other piece I would ask the the policy committee to think about I, I do think now that I've heard the comments from our librarians um, under subsection C under section C subsection B um, you really could read that as you have to read everything you've ordered in order to identify where that exists and um, we may want to figure out what the intention is and figure out how to avoid that having um, be the expectation for new materials. I, I'm not confident we could, we could ask our librarians to read 500 books that they're ordering. And they do have to rely on a selection process which is already identified in policy. Um, so I would maybe suggest we look at that section specifically. And then there was the, the conversation about found and that the intention of found was if it's found, not that we have to go looking for it, but I do think that probably needs to get clarified because if, if I read found, my, the first thing that pops into my mind after listening to the comments is how, like found how, is it an expectation that we go find it? Or is it simply that somebody finds it upon checking it out and then brings it to our attention? I think that was the intention based on my conversation with my team. And if that's the intention, we probably should say that more clearly um, so that you know, we can give our staff some assurance that no, you're not expected to cull through your entire collection and, and find this stuff. That's my, um, I just wanted to sort of bring that up maybe a little bit more than you asked. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Um, Ms. Owens, are you finished? Um, actually, I, I just wanted uh, another clarification and okay. uh, kind of following up from Dr. Spence, it does appear that there are places that in this policy I'd like to see tightened up, clarified, or better explained before I could feel comfortable uh, getting behind it. Um, I also want to make sure that this is, I guess, just applying to materials that are on our shelves in the library, or is the expectation that any of the books or materials that are through the 
multiple uh, online collections uh, are also read through or, or whatever you guys decide how you're going to clarify that. Um, book fairs, are librarians required to know what's in all the books that are being sold? Uh, like, what does this, where does it entail? Is it just shelved materials? Uh, you know, it talks about films, digital images. Uh, do we have any videos in our libraries? Do they need to also watch all the videos? Or, or uh, if they don't have to watch them, are waiting for those videos to be found? I just want to make sure that it, it's really clear because there, there are a lot of concerns. And, you know, if we look at the number of parents who've opted out versus the number of parents who came to speak in favor of this not going through, um, it, it's clear to me that we need a lot of clarification or, or not having it. Um, and so that's where I'm at with it. Thank you. Ms. Owens, if I will point out to you in Section A, it does refer to, it says this facility shall contain print and digital resources, and it goes on, so I'm guessing that it intends to cover the digital resources as well. I don't know if any of those were counted when they were giving all of the the counts of the resources that they uh, are responsible for, so. Okay, thank you. Ms. Franklin? Um, thank you. And, you know, I, I personally, I think that awareness is always good, right? Knowledge is power. Uh, we've heard that expression before. So I don't think discussion is a bad thing. Um, I appreciate the PRC looking at this. Um, to respect the parents that have concerns. I also appreciate our librarians and LMSs for the work they do and um, uh, the great work they do, I should say. And I have to tell you that, particularly since there were so many librarians and LMSs that had brought up some very valid points, I feel like we, at this point, I personally as well, could not support this and I, I, I would not want to see this on a consent agenda for next time. I really feel like there has to be work that needs to be done still, perhaps discussing, bringing them into the conversation um, to ensure that they understand the, the, uh, the nature and the requirement that would be pushed um, on their plate and, um, and you know, get, get some feedback from them directly um, before we go ahead and vote as a board on this policy. That's just my personal opinion, but I personally would like to see this uh, kick back to the committee um, for additional review and, and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Martin. Hi. Um, I apologize for my voice. I'll speak as loudly as I can here. Um, first of all, I do want to thank the PRC committee um, for embracing like this concept of safe spaces and trigger warnings um, for our students, because that's what Senate Bill 656 and this policy 665 really are. They're, they're safe spaces and trigger warnings. I was really surprised that our conservative administration in Richmond would essentially embrace trigger warnings and safe spaces, but I'm glad it's trickled down to the local level. And we recognize that we do have students who've experienced trauma and we don't want them re-traumatized through some of the materials they might find in the library. Um, but this is a complicated issue. You know, I'm a first generation American, daughter of a World War II survivor who, who survived Nazi occupation in Konigsberg, Prussia. Um, I really can't support the removal of library books by a government body. And I'm really also concerned as a literature professor that folks think that clinical textbooks and health classes are adequate for teaching students about themselves and their bodies or that history textbooks can really convey the horrors of sexual assault as a tool of war. I mean, textbooks as a thing are only about 150 years old. Humans learn best through stories, and we've learned through stories for, for thousands of years. Um, so I really think that we need to, to th really think this through. I'm concerned about the policy being used to silence underrepresented voices. So for instance, Sally Hemings' life story would most likely be banned in K through five because of her role in the household. And yet Thomas Jefferson is very much featured in K through five learning. And, and true stories, no matter how painful, are important in our lexicon. And I don't want those removed from the library shelves. But I do know that parents are concerned about their children's access to information. Um, 
And so it's a really complicated issue and I wanna acknowledge that. I want students to have a safe space and I want students to have access to a wide variety of stories. So I think we've addressed this through those changes to the procurement policy and what's required in Senate Bill 656. Um, I think we have a good policy for parents and system to, ch to challenge library books and for those books to re be reviewed. But for Ms. Linetti, I have a question here. Because Senate Bill 656 is only about instructional materials and specifically section four says that the bill does not allow for censorship or banning of any books in elementary or secondary schools. Does policy 665 then like violate the Dillon rule? Because doesn't the state reserve all powers unless they're expressly, expressly permitted by the locality? Because I know that some candidates and legislators are going to bring this library issue into the 2024 session. And I think we have enough guardrails in place right now to let that play out at the state level and then proceed with our policy changes accordingly, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to go ahead and answer that? Answer, answer. Ms. Martin, yes. um, there's yes, a couple issues you've got going policy. here. And uh, let me start with saying, let me stop referring to it as Senate Bill 646. This bill is nothing after the General Assembly. There's actually a law that was enacted, Code of Virginia 22.116.8. That's actually where the instructional material uh, from the bills came in. So that's actually where you'd be referring to as the Code of Virginia section. And that did say instructional materials. So that was what you were required to adopt. So this, as presented as a proposed 656, is not required by the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is something that was proposed by uh, members of the PRC to bring that forward. So that's just something voluntary. And I'll note that when they're taking the definitions, the definition section is exactly what you see in six policy 611, which is Virginia Code 22.116.8, the instructional material. So they just picked that up and brought that over here. It gets a little bit, when you're talking about censorship and banning books, you have to be a little bit careful as what you're dealing with. The courts recognize that certain age levels certain material is not going to be appropriate. And universally, they're going to say the elementary school, they're going to leave to the decision of the community what's appropriate. When you're at middle and high school, that's when you're looking a little bit more at the censorship issues are going to play in. So I think what you've got drafted here, which is talking about taking out library materials out of elementary schools that are sexually explicit, I think that would withhold a legal challenge because you've made a determination that that's not appropriate for elementary school if you put through this policy. What you have in the existing library material section for existing and purchase for secondary allows the challenge process, which you already have in place anyway. And that's where you would look at the issues as to whether you would do it. This is not necessarily censoring. This sexually, putting on a sexually explicit library material list, as you would see in 611 and 655, is creating a list for a parent to look at. There's a different, the challenge process, which we've looked at in past years, which appears in section seven or section six, how do you get a book removed? That's where you would see the censorship, and that is actually a different test, and quite honestly, it's very difficult to get some of that removed because of what you, the, the three-part te your test you're going to have to go through. So I just wanna clarify, it gets confusing when you're dealing in this area. 611 and 655 have to do with identifying what is sexually explicit and putting it on a list so a parent can make a decision. If you want to censure or remove a book, you're going to go to our Section 7 policy or a Section 6 policy on challenge material or removing material. That's where the censorship law comes in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Melnick. Okay, and so the public understands, Mrs. Linetti, you just mentioned the challenge process. And so we recently had a school board member challenge a, a book series called Assassination Classroom. And um, that book was reviewed by five library media specialists, one high school teacher, two high school parents, eight high school students. The board member was asking for the series to be removed and we actually received the results of that challenge yesterday. And um, there were comments from all parties. And one st struck me because 
I'm thinking about a board member challenging an entire series, and then I read this comment. I hope the committee considers the good this series did, my son, the fact that it brought us an even greater understanding of each other, and that one troubling detail helped drive a patriotic point home and actually answers the question about killing anyone with a definitive and profound no. I hope the day comes when I read this story with my grandkids so I can teach them about wielding power responsibly. So that was pretty profound to me, um, the difference, the alpha and omega in someone's perception of a book or a series of books. And it is why I once again ask, um, and echoed by Mrs. Franklin, that this committee goes back. I'd actually like to see them strike this policy and that we rely on the law as it now stands, which again is already difficult enough. Thank you. Um, Ms. Manning. Okay, well, I want to clarify because um, I brought up the assassination classroom, but I, number one, I didn't challenge it and I didn't ask for it to be removed. I have the email right here. I asked Dr. Spence if he could please review the book and give me some feedback on it because I had some concerns that um, in some of the books it showed a teacher kissing a student and making out with a student and that didn't seem appropriate to me and I wanted his feedback on it. He then decided to convene a panel um, to review the books. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, and you know, thank you all for your feedback. Um, Dr. Spence, thank you for your feedback. Um, you know, th this was, as, as Ms. Brown pointed out, this was something that we worked very closely with administration on as well. We wanted their feedback on this. And um, this isn't, for me personally, I would like to see stronger language in here, but I also want to hear all sides and bring everybody together to protect our children. That's what this is about for me. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Williams? Um, yes, um, I too would suggest um, that the policy committee take this back and really clarify and tighten up in the areas of what does found a book actually mean, who finds it, what's the responsibility of the librarians in that case. Um, obviously, we don't expect librarians to read four or 500 books um, every year. I sure don't. So um, I think that you have clarified that up, that, it, that we don't expect them to do that, but just to clarify who finds it, what happens, and you know, what process after that. Um, also, if we can somehow tighten up, um, and I don't know if we can because it's in state code, but lewd exhibition of sex, you know, just the wording of that so, so that we know so we don't have unintended consequences of books being removed that shouldn't be removed. Um, also clarify um, what books exactly um, does it count, the videos, the e-books, or anything like that. So um, I think that we need to go back to committee and tighten this up and um, for future discussion. Madam Chair, I call the vote, please. Um, first, uh, Dr. Spence wanted to say something. And there's, there's a, just, just a couple other people that. Um, just, just because it's come up a couple of times and you said it just now, Mrs. Weems, I just wanted to jump in real quick and clarify one thing. Because you said, that, you know, we don't want the books to be removed. Um, the only way the books get removed in Virginia Beach right now is through the, in, the challenge process. So that's the other part. If a book is on... This would again be relative to 656, but I suspect would be the intention based on my reading of this policy. If a book is on a list that is not banned or removed, it's simply on a list to suggest that there may be sexually explicit material in there based on that definition, and the law requires us to list it. But the book is, uh, those instructional materials that are on that list that's on our website, 
Anne Frank's novel being one of them, are still being used in our schools, and their children still are reading them. It's just on a list so that a parent could, um, and, and then we notify parents based on that law um, in advance of the instruction to say, if you don't want your child reading this. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yeah, I, and I knew that, but that's exactly what the misinformation is getting out, that all of a sudden we're removing all these books and banning books, and that is not true, but that, that we know exactly who makes the list, what criteria is followed to make the list, and, and the exact process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Okay, Ms. Anderson. So, um, current policy already allows parents to challenge or um, ask for their children to be put on a list that uh, to, to prohibit their children from checking out certain books. One of the things that I asked for in the policy committee was to eliminate the wording under 2A where it said any existing library materials that contain sexually explicit content found in elementary schools must be removed by the beginning of 23-24. I, I actually originally asked for that section to be removed because I felt that the wording in B should include elementary. And so I was kind of attacked at one point and someone said, well, that means you must want elementary children to see sexually explicit material. No, that's not, you know, I, I resent anyone putting those words in my mouth. That is not what I want to see, but I also don't want to be removing books just because of someone else's opinion on what a book might include. For example, sexually explicit material. What, um, what, it, what causes sexual excitement? We don't know. For someone, it might be somebody seeing someone wearing a bikini and they get really sexually excited. I can remember the day when the boys used to hurry up and go get the, the Sears catalog so they could see the women wearing underwear. They weren't nude, but they were wearing underwear, and it sexually excited certain boys, certain people. I shouldn't say boys, but certain people. So what causes sexual excitement? We're not sure in some people. So that, that's kind of ambiguous in itself. Um, but so, so I just feel like, you know, when it comes to removing a book, uh, we're going to remove it. Not that I want children to be able to see nude people in, in, in sexual encounters. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm not sure we need to be saying that we're going to remove a book just because it happens to be in elementary school. But we're going to allow parents to put it on a list or ask to put it on a list in, in middle school and high school. So I just feel like those are some, that's one of the things that I'd like to see worked on when we go back to policy. Yes, I'd like to see this whole thing go back to policy. We need to, we need to either eliminate the whole thing because what we already have where parents can right now um, ask for their children to not be able to read certain books. We already have a policy in place that takes care of that and I don't feel that this is necessary. So. Um, I'm willing to take it back to policy, though, and um, if, if that's what this body wants. Thank you. Um, Mr. Culpepper has not been able to speak, and he did raise his hand, so I am going to give him that opportunity. Okay. I was actually going to say something the superintendent said a moment ago, but it's... Slow down. But it's probably worth saying again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> slowly and clearly. <laughs> Thank you. There are, there are two distinct things going on here, one of which we're discussing in this policy and one that we're not, right? State code 656, we're not discussing. And that does not cover what's in a library. That covers instructional materials, as the superintendent pointed out. And nothing that gets on the list under that law is banned. All it says is, tell parents this exists, and if they don't want their kids to see it, offer them something else. And that's a very reasonable position for the state to take. And we need to do nothing to follow that, just like the superintendent pointed out, we already are, okay? So nobody's looking to ban 1984, the diary of Anne Frank, to kill a mockingbird, which are all classics. If a parent doesn't want their kids to read that, that's their choice. Now, what we're talking about here is what we put in our libraries. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many books there are in the world. There are lots of them. 
when we have a less than 1% in our libraries. So we are very selective about the books we put in our libraries, and that's also a very reasonable position for us to take. And we're also, as you pointed out a moment ago, we're not even talking about banning books from our libraries other than what we define as sexually explicit in elementary schools. And I don't, I don't find any objection to that, but uh, as Ms. Weems just pointed out, hey, maybe we need a more clear definition. And there are several already in state law. So there's definition of harmful to juveniles, which is a much higher bar than lewd, and it's more explicit, even though uh, Ms. Linde pointed out that there is, there are standards in law of what, calls, what constitutes lewd as well. I'm, I'm fine with that being a high bar for anything we remove. It should be a high bar. And thankfully, the 11 of us couldn't ban a book if we wanted to. We, we don't have that power. So no matter what we say about what books that we very carefully and consciously select to put in our small libraries, if a parent wants another book for their kids, they can get it. Mm -hmm. They're readily available. Mm -hmm. Amazon is cheap and quick. So I don't think we should overreact to these things we're talking about here, which are all very reasonable policies. And there definitely needs to be some things cleaned up on here to make sure that we all understand what our responsibilities are under this. And my only last question actually is, you know, it, it tells the superintendent here to define the process uh, if a book is challenged. I'm interested in what the appeal process for that is. I mean, let's just say, for example, that a, a, a parent complains about a book, and it goes to the first level, and they say, oh, yes, we've got to get rid of this book. And then somebody else says, no, it's a great book. It should be here. And ultimately, I think that challenge should come to us, right? If it goes that far, it should come to us. Eleven people that the people of Virginia Beach elected and can fire to make those decisions in the end. I don't know if that should be written in this policy per se, but it definitely has to be in there somewhere. Ultimately, the buck, buck has to stop here because that's where the voters get to, get to also vote. That's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Culpepper, Ms. Owens. Thank you, and this truly is just a question, not a commentary. Uh, I'm not sure how our uh, old donation library works. I see in the policy that we have like a difference on what we're gonna do with elementary versus middle school. Do they have two separate libraries that they're not allowed to uh, commingle? like a, a fifth grader cannot go into the middle school library there or vice versa so that we are, if this were to go through and we were doing something different with elementary schools, uh, that elementary school student wouldn't go into the middle school library and have something that would be removed in a different elementary if they were there? I'm not sure I can answer that question. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, so your question is, like the ODS, you've got the elementary level and the middle school. How can one, library. Can, it, can one level, can the elementary school get like a middle school level library book? Uh, Dr. Spence? Yeah, well, yes, that is our, that's our only building that has that library, but students have access to all the books in that library, right, Kim? Well, can't hear you. Mm -hmm. the, can you rephrase, the, can you restate the question, please, so that I have a complete understanding of it? Sure. At Old Donation uh, School, uh, I know they have elementary grades there, they have middle school grades there. Do they utilize the same library? Does an elementary school, an elementary grade student have access to read a middle school level book in their library if they so choose to? And would those students have access to greater information than other students in our school system? So I will need to get 100% confirmation of that. They use the same space. Um, and I don't certainly don't want to misspeak um, with that. I know I have staff here, but I don't. Let me get the answer to that question specifically. My um, my professional response would be, no, they don't have access to the same textbooks because they're two separate uh, great, two separate levels, but I will certainly get 100% uh, accurate information for you to, via email. Thank you. Certainly. Okay, Ms. Brown. Okay, so I want to respond first um, to a couple of comments that we should not um, review this policy. So there is a state law that we have to review our policies once every five years. 
If you look at the bottom of this policy, it was last reviewed March 21st, 2017, which means that we must review this policy. And so um, I don't know how it got missed, but it was overlooked. Um, it's actually been six years. So we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to go back and take another look at this in the PRC. Um, I understand what some people are saying about um, some of these definitions. Again, we worked in consult with legal um, to make sure these were clear, but I'm sure that we can clear them up some more. And um, I hear the concerns about old donation as well. Um, so anyway, I just wanna say this policy, we're reviewing it. It's gotta be reviewed, that's the law. Okay, I'm gonna give one more person the opportunity to speak because he hasn't spoken tonight, Mr. Callan. We are staring into the face of an issue that has been wrestled with for decades. I think it was 1964, and there was a presidential commission formed on the issue of pornography. We've been trying to wrestle with this issue ever since. And I believe it was Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart and since I'm going on recollection, that could be wrong. But in essence, Potter Stewart was reg regarded as somewhat remarkable because of his statement. And as he was trying to come to a definition of what constituted pornography, he came up with a statement of, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> And so we've got this challenge, and my concern is, having lived long enough to have gray hair, here's what I've seen. My culture has coarsened. We continue culturally in many ways to spiral in a downward direction and not an upward direction. I think things like this material that's able to be read in elementary schools or high schools or middle schools, it can seem as though we're trying to strain out a gnat in order to define this thing correctly. But I think we should take the responsibility of trying to address it in order to maybe do something that's actually impossible. Can we, by the decisions that we make, slow down the coarsening of the culture in Virginia Beach? Maybe that's just a pipe dream. But I'd like to be a part of a group that was rolling up their sleeves and diving into a tough issue in order to try and lift the culture instead of watch it continually coarsen and worsen. So I say we go back and do something that's going to be doggedly difficult, but we take a good stab at it in order to try and come up with something that continues to do what we all, regardless of where we are philosophically, where we are all, and that is on this board with one primary desire, create an environment that allows the kids that are in this school system to get a fantastic education that's not only based on data and formulas and information, but also seeks to instill in them the noble virtues that we want all of our citizens to grow up and become. And with that, I yield. Dr. Spence has the answer for your question about ODS, and Ms. Owens has stepped out. But go ahead, Dr. Spence. Yeah, and I'll also correct, we do have another school with a fish shared facility. Um, Speak loud. Yes, I will correct, we do have another school with a shared facility. Um, the. Um, Books, they do not have access to, elementary students do not have access to middle school books. They're labeled as middle school books. That's the short answer. I don't know how to do this. 
<laughs> Never had this problem in the other building. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to have to do this. Um, there are, there's more than just ODS that has a shared facility, and middle school students and elementary students' books are labeled differently, and elementary students cannot check out middle school books. There's the answer. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, so are we, sent, we will send policy 665 back to PRC to work on, but the other five policies will go. Yes, we have to asked to do that. So do we need a vote to do that? This is information, but I think you can okay. make a vote, but I think you just send it back. Okay, so it's information. Everybody's fine with us saying, I think we've all said, let's send it back. Let's work on, let policy review work on it. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, C, general fee schedule for fiscal year 2023-2024. Ms. Pate. Good evening, Chairwoman Riggs, Vice Chairwoman Weems, school board members, and Dr. Spence. As we do each year before you is the general fee schedules containing the approved 2022-23 assessed fees and the proposed 2023-24 fees. There are some increases and there are several fees that will not see changes for the upcoming school year. I'm not going to go over each of them specifically and hopefully you've had an opportunity to review. There will be no increase in student meal prices for the next school year. There are also no changes for summer school tuition or summer programs, no changes for evening credit, program tuition. There's no changes for driver education program fees and no changes to student transcript fees or student parking fees. On page two, you'll see the fee line under the adult learning center courses for tuition, text, and materials. The back end of that range was increased by $101. This was due to an increase in the fees charged by the contractor who does our medical classes. Also on the same page, the fee for the adult student Licensed Practical Nursing Program increased by $265 as a result of an increase in the cost of the ATI or the Assessment Technologies Institute exam, background screenings, and lab fees. All other fee and tuition remain the same for the Adult Learning Center. There are no changes to the ATC courses, Business and Information Technology courses, Family and Consumer Science courses, the Substance Abuse Intervention Program, also known as SAPE, and no changes to technology education courses. On page four, under Technical and Career Education Center courses, you will see an increase of $10 for Practical Nursing 1 and 2 due to the increase in the cost of the materials needed for the lab packs. Also, there is an increase of $14 for cosmetology toolkits due to the increase in the cost of the materials that go into those kits. And there's also an increase for electronics one lab pack fee of $5, also due to an increase in the cost for the lab pack components. The last item I'll cover is the student tuition fees for non-resident students. As you may be aware, it was decided to allow children of VBCPS employees who live outside of Virginia Beach to attend Virginia Beach schools tuition free. So you'll see that the first two items for VBCS employees show the fees for elementary and secondary to be zero. The non-resident student tuition fees for all others were calculated as they have been in the past. You can see the elementary level, there's a $300 increase, a $200 increase at the secondary level, and a $1,300 increase in F1 student tuition. These calculations are based on our expenditures with some adjustments, and the increases are a product of increased costs mainly in salaries and building services such as utilities and purchase services. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay, oh, Ms. Brown. So I'm trying to find the information from our um, proposed budget. So. I don't believe that this um, F1 student tuition, that doesn't cover our cost per pupil cost, does it? 
It should. It's, it does? Yeah, F1 by law, they have to pay an, a fully unsubsidized cost. Okay. Um, so we do adjust that differently. They don't get any of the um, benefits of us getting federal money or state money. It's, it, it's because they don't, as international students and families, they don't t pay any taxes. Okay. Okay, and I think it's great that we're offering our employees that perk, so thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, thank Ms. You. Bate. Um, so we are now on um, our next section, which is D, the Building Utilization Committee, report to the school board. Madam Chair, Vice, Madam Vice Chair, members of the school board and Dr. Spence. My name is Ron Berkebile and I am newly appointed as the demographer for the schools. This is my maiden voyage to the, to the board. I hope and pray that I don't sink like the formidable Titanic in this voyage, but here we go. The purpose for this presentation is to inform the school board of the building utilization committee's determinations and share some of the information that was discussed during the meeting. This is very brief. Uh, we're, at the end, we'll be able to answer some questions if you should, if you have any. In accordance with policy 5-14, school attendance zones, the building utilization committee has uh, abided by the policy guidelines and. Uh, commendable, sorry, and commendable, um, commendably made recommendations. The committee's objectives were to review the enrollment trends and capacity data, consider the data's impact upon the facilities and attendance zones, if needed, determine rezoning needs and make recommendations, determine optional, op, optimal facility utilization, and most importantly, limit adverse impacts upon students and schools. With a division-wide utilization rate of minus 7.4% uh, within the acceptable utilization range of plus or minus 10%, the committee and facility services are not recommending zoning changes for the upcoming school year. The committee met at the end of March. It was a productive meeting. Uh, the committee was comprised of seven members. It was chaired by our school board member, Mr. David Culpepper. In the current school year, the K through 12 membership was approximately 63,600 students. In addition to the K to 12 membership was supplemented by the ECSE pre-K and CSEP programs. In total, approximately 65,400 students were served. So how did we get to this membership level? Historically, membership um, peaked in school year 1997-98. Subsequently, membership declined. As a proactive me measure, an earlier committee proposed closing a school to better utilize facility space. In school year 2009-10, Plaza Elementary uh, School was closed and students were, re were reassigned. In addition, to achieve optimal utilization, the elimination of portables took place. To date, 320 portables have been eliminated from all school levels. This is equivalent to seven to eight uh, elementary schools. And students attending portable classes were reintegrated into the uh, school classrooms. In addition, in school year 2021, full day kindergarten was achieved. Division wide and uh, offset additional membership declines. Supplementing this, the YMCA's early discovery program management shifted to the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Lastly, there is a COVID effect. It disrupted normal school operations, as you know, and virtual teaching was implemented. Today, most students have reverted back to in-person learning. 
This graph illustrates the impacts attributable to the historical factors. But before I begin, I just have to explain there's a lot of data associated with this. So what I'm going to do is just summarize uh, briefly what this data represents. As discussed earlier, in school year 1997-98, membership peaked. Over the next 10 years, membership declined 10%. This precipitated proactive discussions to close the Plaza Elementary School and began a, and with, and a process for beginning to eliminate portables. Over the next 10 years, the membership rate of decline slowed. This preceded the COVID uh, period. During COVID, the rate of decline slightly increased. Following COVID, membership demonstrated a level of consistency. Of note, the K through 12 has continued to decline but membership has actually increased. The ECSE, pre-K, and CSEP programs are growing. For instance, the K through 12 membership decreased by 100. But when ECSE, pre-K, and CSEP are included, total membership increased by 59 students. In the graph, the green bars are, are topped by orange blocks. The orange blocks represent the ECSE, pre-K, and CSEP membership. Projections for the next uh, five years indicate consistency with the last two years. The projections do not include such things as unforeseen uh, demographic or economic shocks, such as another pandemic or base closures. This density map illustrates the relationship between spatial areas and student membership. The high density areas are around Green Run, Bayside, Salem, and Kempsville. Low density areas include the resort and Creeds. As you'll observe on the upcoming slides, high density areas have small zones and low density areas have large zones. To achieve optimal utilization, student membership, programmatic requirements, and prescribed seats per room are defining factors. Moreover, year-over-year -year capacity rates can change. The capacity rates are also dependent upon student-teacher ratios. For elementary schools, there are 56 facilities and approximately 30,000 students. There are 40 schools within the range of plus or minus 10% and 14 below range. Historically, individual school membership has experienced cyclical be periods uh, ranging between um, the under, under capacity and at capacity periods. A newly derived, uh, uh, and we're watching those, facility management watches those on a regular, facility services watches those on a regular basis. A newly derived algorithm includes a good possibility for one elementary school returning back to range in school year 23-24. Note Williams is out of range, but when combined with the other two schools in the tri-campus area, it is in range. There is one school division-wide above range. Point of view is one-tenth of one percent above range. Based upon net birth resident data, point of view may be in range next year. However, two years from now, three new housing developments will be uh, accepting tenants. Facility Services is monitoring these developments and has proactively um, created what are called what-if scenarios. For middle schools, there are 16 facilities and approximately 15,000 students. There are nine schools in range and five below range. According to the algorithm, as spoken of earlier, two schools may come back into range next year. These, there are no schools above capacity or over capacity for the middle schools. For high schools, there are 11 attendance zones and approximately 20,000 students. There are six schools within range and five schools under capacity. Like the elementary schools, there is cyclical behavior and facility services is monitoring them. According to the algorithm, there is potential for three schools to come back into range next year. There are no schools over capacity in the high school level. To summarize, we are grateful for the committee's hard work and the contributions that they've made in uh, discussing these, this data. 
The power and logic of the committees have been proven year after year, and this year is no different. Former committees proactively closed Plaza Elementary School when declining membership became persistent and, um, and portables were eliminated. Currently, the K through 12 membership slightly declined, but was uh, offset by ECSE, pre-K, and CSEP, the CSEP growth. Projections are consistent with current conditions. Division-wide, the acceptable utilization rate is minus 7.4%, and there are no recommendations to rezone. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Ms. Anderson? So I, I could be confused here. I'm looking at it because it's so tiny. Um, does the yellow, can we look at the middle schools, please? Does the yellow mean that they're under capacity? Yes, ma'am. Which means that the Great Neck area schools are, the Great Neck school is under capacity, okay? But then you have VB, Virginia Beach Middle, at, at capacity. And, and then corporate landing, again, you have it under capacity, or under capacity. So my point that I want to make, though, is that I heard from some parents at VB Middle um, that they didn't have enough students to field a football team last fall. And so we got to looking into it, and at the time, and I asked, actually, I think in December, asked the Building Utilization Committee to take a look at it and find out you know, because at that time it looked like VB Middle didn't have enough students to field a football team. And I just couldn't understand what, what could have happened there that they didn't have enough, yet all, all the other middle schools did have enough students. And I, I, don't, I don't know whether it was just a matter of there weren't students interested, but I was told at the time that VB Middle um, didn't have enough, really, ha they weren't, they didn't have enough students. So I, I, did you look at that and do any comparisons between VB Middle, the number of students that it has? Is, is the school just built to hold less students than the other middle schools? I'd like to know why there was such a difference in the number of students last fall, and then now it states that, that they're at capacity, yet it's stating that, and I, at the time I was told that Corporate Landing had more students than they actually needed, so my, my thought was, well, maybe we needed to enlarge the zone for VB Middle to include some from corporate landing, but this indicates that the opposite. So, uh, um, what, do you have the numbers for those schools available for us tonight, or could you send me the numbers, or just maybe send me a copy of your booklet that shows the exact numbers for those schools? Yeah, so we have, uh, Ms. Anderson, we have looked at this situation. You've got two things happening here. You've got a demographic issue, and you've got an economic right. issue. Remember that the resort is just that, and a lot of the housing in the resort area is turning into shared housing, or as some people may call Airbnb. Uh, we've confirmed that with the planning department with the city of Virginia Beach, and uh, we also we also noticed that the price of housing in that area, especially since the, the Cavalier houses have been gone up, have gone up, have escalated to a point where you can't find a home for less than a half a million dollars. And so, you know, right. our, typically, not always, but typically what happens is with the younger uh, age groups or the parents that are moving into this area, they're not gonna move into that, this area because of the price of housing. So we've got two challenges there that, that we have looked at and we're gonna continue to monitor that. Okay. Um, so Melissa has your numbers for you. Oh great, I'd love to see that. And if, you, if, if possible, can you see that I get one of those booklets that shows everything that, you, that the committee was able to see as well? Absolutely, Ms. Anderson, thank, thank you. you. Um, so interestingly enough, so Great Neck Middle School is 10.7% um, under capacity, which is just 7 tenths of a percent under capacity. Virginia Beach Middle School is 9.6% under capacity, which is within the acceptable util utilization range, so right around 0.4% though, um, to go to be over um, under 10%. So they're both, um, I think your um, 
you know, the information that you received is correct. They're both teetering right around the under capacity at capacity state. Um, Great Neck Middle School um, does accommodate additional students at 1,178 students this year based on the, on the school's needs with a population of 1,052 students at Great Neck Middle School. And Virginia Beach Middle School this year um, in relation to students' needs at the school accommodates 638 students with a student population of 577 students. Um, as Mr. Berkelbaugh explained, we did look at Virginia Beach Middle School um, in response to some of the questions we received from the board prior to the Building Utilization Committee. Um, as Mr. Berkelbaugh explained, the demographic situation right. um, of Virginia Beach Middle School and really cost, per, cost of living in Virginia Beach in general does have a factor in this as well um, in all of our schools. Um, however, one of the additional um, trends that we saw with Virginia Beach Middle School over the last several years is the accommodation of the elementary school students from SeaTac Elementary School, rather than going to their um, in-zone school of Virginia Beach Middle School, some, some have gone on to Lynn Haven Middle School for the Achievable Dream Middle School program. Okay. So that is even taking additional students that um, might have formerly attended Virginia Beach Middle School and accommodated them at Lynn Haven Middle School. Now, Virginia Beach Middle School does currently also still operate the art program, one of our academies at the middle school level, and um, those numbers are also watched by um, TNL and our office as well. So hopefully in the future, I would like you to look at possibly enlarging uh, the VB Middle uh, zone a little bit, even if you go up into, say, the Fort Story area, because um, I know that goes into Great Neck, but um, but I mean, I, I, I'm just just a suggestion because there are a lot of students that that they have that we possibly could help. Because I mean, that's a big, huge difference: 638 students to to 1,100. I mean, yes. um, that's like more than double. So um, the parents who complained were upset that their students didn't have an opportunity to to play you know, middle school football to prepare them for high school. So that, that and I can understand their concern. Um, Absolutely, and receiving this type of information from the committee, um, from parents, from schools, as we go through this process is very helpful to help us understand what we need to be monitoring um, as years continue to see what changes might need to be made in the future. Okay. So appreciate that. I hope, hopefully you'll monitor that closely. Thank Keep you. Keep that in mind, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Brown. Okay, so I'm really glad that she pointed out that the yellow ones were the ones that were under capacity because that answered my first question. My second question was that you mentioned three of our high schools have the potential to go back to capacity. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, can you please tell me which three high schools those are? They are Salem, Tallwood, and Kellum. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Manny. Well, Mr. Berkwell, you have some big shoes to fill, but you're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Appreciate that. Um, how many portables do we currently have? Uh, approximately 50. 50, okay. And I also would like to get a copy of the BUC book. Um, I assume, I think Ms. Owens does as well. Maybe the whole board could get a copy of one of those. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, is that it? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Now we are on um, E, the bylaw discussion on student representative to the school board. I know. We... I just wanted to explain again that um, we changed our, our altered our um, agenda to bring this to a workshop for the future, uh, very close future. Okay, everybody okay with that? All right, we're going to move on to uh, 13. We're bringing you back, guys, to speak. So let's start with um, 
Ms. Taniato, our next speakers. Okay, our next speakers will be Fred Hodges, Don Labar, and Melissa Lukeson. Good evening, school board members. My name is Fred Hodges. I'm the parent of a senior here in Virginia Beach. Not lived my whole life in Virginia Beach, but I am here now, and I just want to say, simply put, banning books, don't do it, it's wrong. I've heard all of y'all say, oh, it's not about banning books. Quit it. It is about setting the, the procedures for someone at a future time. You've said, all the librarians don't need to read all the books, we don't need to do this. But you put policy into effect and then later on that policy will be implemented by possibly not you. And it will be implemented based on the language that you're using and the language in this policy that you're putting forward does provide for the possibility of banning books and making this country into, in this particular area, into a totalitarian and autocratic situation. Only extremists ban books. The First Amendment gives us the right to free speech, but it's intended to be the right to full and complete thought, to think critically. If you have only been exposed to the things that, that somebody carefully cultivates for you to, you can't think critically, you then become nothing more than a robot based on the input that's been put in to all of that. I have watched for over 40 years, while mostly one particular political ideology, but not alone, has had an attack on public education. It began when I was still in high school back in the 80s, and they talked about the, the costs of schools, so let's cut funding. Then it was cut teacher salaries, or at least not increase them to be able to continue with the cost of living. It then went into things like, let's control curriculum, let's review the curriculum, which almost always gets into putting in propaganda and not really true education. And that's truly what's going on in our world today with the whole idea of the culture wars. Somebody earlier said this is a beachhead. This is a beachhead for Virginia Beach into the culture wars. Somebody up here said, oh, this particular policy isn't required. It only made us look at the um, ideas that were being put forward in classroom curriculum. Now you want to go to the libraries. Libraries should be safe for all students. You make a policy, it's not going to include everybody. My heart is very saddened that I was the only speaker, or not the only speaker, but the first speaker who had to wait until y'all had your turn, because I would have loved to have um, had the young people hear this next thing. I am here speaking about the libraries and, and um, the policy 6-65, but I have to tell 30 you, seconds. Almost, almost 32 years ago, I met the most important transgendered person in my life. They were born with the name um, Nathaniel. They are now Alana, and that's my oldest child, who sent a message this night not knowing that I was talking about banning books, and that person said, go, Dad. Because I am here to tell you that what you're trying to do is to begin a process to stop people from thinking. Thank you. And that is time. Our next speaker is Don Labar, then Melissa Lukeson, Number 23 is a duplicate, and then it'll be Larry Siegel. Pretty sure Don left. Welcome. Hi. In January, I stood before this body and expressed concerns about assigning Vicki Manning and Kathleen Brown to serve on the Policy Review Committee. Ms. Franklin, I told you back then that you will be reminded of that vote every time you are faced with and must vote on the most extreme policies Ms. Manning and Ms. Brown will put forth. This proposed policy update to 665 sends the wrong message to our education professionals that you were elected to support. I strongly oppose adding the definition of sexually explicit content and nudity to our library media centers professional libraries policy. VBCPS is already following the law. 
and adding this unnecessary definition is the beginning of a more nefarious plan by Ms. Manning, Ms. Brown, and other members of the school board. They're using this policy to remove books from elementary school libraries. For middle schools and high schools, they are setting the stage to win their book challenges based on this definition of nudity that will override educators and remove access to books. They're trying to weaponize school policy against students, parents, teachers, and library media specialists. We have an epidemic in this country, an epidemic of manufactured ignorance. Religious right-wing cultural warriors who conduct a culture war, whitewashing history, banning ideas, and censoring books is nothing less than naked fascism. At the heart of this political strategy is the expansion of state control over public and private life under the facade of popular support and the common good designed primarily to boost conservative turnout at election time. We've had more speakers tonight speak against this policy than we've had parents who challenge books. Remove the Virginia flag? I don't know, there's a nipple on it. Was it a wardrobe malfunction or is it sexually explicit? Because the current definition of nudity in this policy applies to the state flag and any books in our libraries with pictures of the state flag on it. So why do we need to add language used in the courts from the Virginia code that applies to criminal charges to our school policy? Is that a veiled threat to library media specialists? Parents have trusted our education professionals for generations. We have library media specialists that have master's degrees and are ex exponentially more qualified than Ms. Brown, the ice skating instructor with a business degree, or Ms. Manning, who thinks because she worked for GEICO that makes her an expert in writing organizational seconds. and legislative policy. There are approximately 185,000 households in the city of Virginia Beach, and two people are driving this policy. Two out of hundreds and thousands of residents in this city. It's disgusting. The implied message in this policy is that the schools are hiding something. On the contrary, there's a great transparency in the educational process. As parents and community members, we must stop allowing these conspiracy theorists and, that is time. and low information leaders. And that is time. Like Vicki Mann. Our next speaker will be Larry Siegel, then Dr. Alan Wagner. Uh, I am asking the audience to please uh, refrain from clapping. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the uh, school board and Mr. Spence. Um, my name is Larry Siegel. I'm an attorney, a, a business person, and the chairman of some not-for-profits in this area. So I'm very proud of the city of Virginia Beach and have been here my entire life. My kids are the product of the public school system in Virginia Beach, and my grandchildren are currently active as well. We learned a lot tonight. I, I learned a lot tonight. I heard a lot of great speakers. I regret that it's this late for you and for me, um, but that's maybe the advantage of being last or next to the last. Um, I heard a couple things that are worth repeating, um, and I hope you heard them as well. First off, there was a young student standing here that reminded me of a landmark Supreme Court case named Tinker, that says you don't park your First Amendment rights at the door, whether you're a student or whether you're a teacher, when you walk into the classroom. You retain those rights. Okay, good point. Point number one, they don't go away. Point number two, as a business person, we recruit constantly. There was a gentleman sitting next to me in the audience who had to leave. We recruited him from Buenos Aires, Argentina. He's a prominent educator. He came a couple of months ago. He came because he was concerned about a policy, a voluntary policy that you're considering that affects library books. I had the pleasure of talking to the mayor because he was present that day when we did his inauguration, and we shared a common story about being proud of the city of Virginia Beach and how we're able, because of who we are, because of our school system, because of our city values, to recruit from out of town. We recruit prominent lawyers from New York every year into Norfolk and Virginia Beach because of who we are. More so in Virginia Beach because the younger lawyers always want to know about the school system. 
the comment was made tonight, I think by Mr. Spence, that very appropriately, the state statute deals with mandatory action in the curriculum, not voluntary action in the library. Do not go down a path prematurely that you will regret at multiple levels. Let the state statute play out. It is ambiguous. It will play out. Maybe it'll be upheld. Maybe it'll be found to be unconstitutional. Not your problem. Don't rush to make a mistake. Let it play out by itself. Don't take voluntary And that is time. Action. Our next speaker is Dr. Alan Wagner. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you for your attention and still being awake uh, regarding the important issue. I'm here this evening to speak specifically and directly, Madam, Sir, and Board Members, about requesting the Policy 665 once reviewed by the committee, the committee hopefully including the Board, members of the community, teachers and parents, that it's defeated, it is obviously not needed, and most importantly, we find it dangerous. I'm a father of four. I've been married for 43 years. My kids are successful. I'm a grandfather of six. I, too, am an educator, and I hold appointments at two graduate educational institutions. Freedom, we've heard it, we talk about it, but what is freedom really? Freedom is, as defined, a state of being free, such as an absence of coercion. It is a lack of constraint in choice or action. Our country was founded and built by those people who were seeking an escape from persecution, an escape from coercion, with the goal of building an open society. The foundation of our freedom, as you know, is the Constitution, we the people. We the people here are for the general welfare to be built, and a general welfare shows no favorites. It allows no exclusions based on specific minority groups, self-limited exclusionary sensitivities of what is deemed acceptable. The policy in question is quite vague. We've heard it many times. The origin and true motive behind the singling out of certain works it remains in question, if not mysteriously and deviously vague. The books in question, many of them are classics. A classic, when targeted, has a pall. A pall is a funerary cloth. It's cast upon them, along with the authors, and worse, anyone who might read it. A young person is a person who is sensitive, if not more than sensitive, to peer pressures and the conditions of acceptance. Their emotional, functional, and intellectual growth is permanently negatively stunted. It is impacted when shamed. These books without preconditions have enlightened generations and shaped a better and more understanding civic construct. How can parents that have likely not read these books have anything to be able to say about them? Compared to educators and librarians, how can they make an informed decision? On the meta scale, Blinding our young readers, removing free choice, promoting a cancel culture at the crucial time in a young person's intellectual and emotional development guarantees that we as a country will fall further behind seconds. the rest of the world. As a region, we won't be able to recruit and we will lose neighbors to a more accepting community. I stand before and with all of you to assure we will silence no one, that without precondition we will listen to all, regardless of the media type, and that we provide an optimal and nurturing learning environment that builds a cohesive future for our community. Otherwise, we will find that this is how democracy dies. Throw out policy 665. And that is Thank time. You. Okay, Madam Chair, that was our last in-person speaker. We are going to move on to our online speakers. Lisa Varga, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Chair Riggs, Superintendent Spence, and members of the board for allowing me to speak tonight with just about two hours left on National Library Workers Day, the one day each year we focus on the work that librarians and library staff do to ensure access to information is open to all. I thank you for sending the policy back to the PRC for further evaluation, and I recommend you involve some of the experts who spoke here tonight about the impact changes will have on their work. Just as we tell our students not to judge a book by its cover, it is vital that you as a board understand you cannot judge a book by a few images or a passage or two. There is a reason 22.1-16.8 does not include library materials, and I'd encourage the PRC to research why. 
The policy references code 18.2-390, which has a list of various definitions. But perhaps the most relevant part to this policy is in section six, where we have this portion to describe materials, quote, when taken as a whole, end quote. Ms. Linetti even mentioned the three prongs related to Miller versus California in 1973. When viewed through this legal lens, it is clear that there is not, nor has there ever been, pornography on the shelves of our school libraries. Librarians do know what's in their library, but you are asking them to look at every book with a different lens, and that lens is subjective. Regarding interpretation as raised by Ms. Owens, interpretation is work and debate that librarians have been doing for hundreds of years. There are, entirely there are entire scholarly archives on the subject. I'd also silent censorship, which is absolutely in effect of being forced to make lists. And I'd also like to clarify something Mr. Culpepper said. This board did in fact ban a book last year. Any changes you make to any policy related to our amazing school librarians can and should be questioned both in intention and implementation. We have watched as members of this board have purposefully exaggerated and misled our community about the intentions and work of LMSs. Undoing the lies and broken trust will take time. Those who comprehend the daily work of LMSs will ensure there is nothing left up to interpretation. I am the executive director of the Virginia Library Association and we represent more than 5,000 librarians and library staff in the Commonwealth. When Virginia Beach makes it into national news this week, let it be for a celebration of the amazing students we've honored here today or for a successful music festi festival. Don't have it be for this policy. 30 seconds. I will not stop. Thank you. Okay, um, speaker number two and number three are not online, so we are going to go to our next speaker, uh, Carolyn Kaywood. Please unmute. Thank you. My name is Carolyn Kaywood. I live in Virginia Beach, District 8, and I am a member of the board of PFLAG Hampton Roads. PFLAG is a support group for families and friends who discover they have in their midst someone who is LGBTQ. It was started 50 years ago by a mother whose love for her gay son turned her into an activist. Every month I hear the stories of parents who want the best for their children. They tell me that every family has unique stresses and strengths and needs for their LBG, LGBTQ child. Often those needs are met by books ideally read and discussed with the family. A book that helps one young person better understand themselves or better communicate with their parents may not be appropriate for a different student or their family. So it's fortunate that libraries have lots of books. If a library had only books that were right for every single person, it would be quite empty. That's what's disturbed about, disturbing about the proposed revision to policy 6-65. The policy has been quadrupled in length for the purpose of keeping books out of library media centers. I reviewed the list of books for classroom reading that were deemed especially explicit, so I have an idea what the effect will be on library collections. Though the policy only requires that the books be put on a list, soon there will be demands to lock them up or throw them out. I fear librarians will avoid buying anything, no matter how valuable, that might add fuel to the fire. It is common knowledge that books about minority characters always seem to get labeled explicit first, whether it be race, religion, disability, poverty, sexual orientation, gender identity, or some other marginalized characteristic. Indeed, any discussion of sexual orientation will seem explicit to some people. But a library with no reference to sexual orientation would tell one teen in 10 that their existence has been erased. I listened to your discussion, but remain deeply concerned that this proposed policy will reduce the likelihood that an LGBTQ student or a student in any minority will find helpful books in the library media center. I ask you to reject this policy change and to 30 keep seconds. that not all parents hold the same views and not all students have the same needs. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Jay White Stone White. Please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Great. I'm a father of two at the Virginia Beach Public School System, and I just wanted to say that the statute from which the list of titles was created is vague and has the potential to isolate important topics that may otherwise be covered in school. Additionally, this policy may result in the unintended consequences of removing art and science textbooks and under guidelines, as we've heard already tonight, the Torah, the Quran, the Christian Bible may be also considered sexually explicit. This policy was clearly drafted without transparency, and I encourage the policy to be removed and appreciate the board from punting it to be reviewed at a later date. I also further uh, believe that it should be reviewed during an open process by a group of known and diverse community members to determine what is and is not appropriate for the students of Virginia Beach. Furthermore, I get it. I really get it. There's a thankfully rapid dying trend of radical voices doing anything they can to be heard. And in that recognizable playbook, they target our children and educators with their alleged agenda under the guise of protection, shielding them from harm and invoking actions that are historically only utilized by fascist regimes. I find it sickening that they use terms like parent rights or phrases like standing up for our children's safety or even religion as their modus operandi. These are people trying to hide educated and evolved content from our youth. They're obviously causing more harm than good, not that they care, that they're only in the game of getting attention and to perpetuate a way of life that thankfully has found its way onto the wrong side of history since the 1950s. Let's put the policies of good old boys done bad and their pathetic efforts on board members to curry favors or simply get on their radars back in the rearview mirror of a once shameful history. I urge the board to vote this down and to help our children grow and learn not to hate. Thank you. And Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. Okay, thank you. So we are moving now to the consent agenda. Um, the following items are on the consent agenda this evening. The resolutions, I'm gonna read through them first, and then we'll have each person read that. One, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Two, the Jewish American Heritage Month. Three, the Teacher Appreciation Week. And then we have under policy review B, policy review committee, PRC recommendations, one policy 4-5 four, four slash criminal or child protective services charges slash findings of filed against employee notification of superintendent, two policy 4-5-6 slash duties and responsibilities of professional teaching staff, Three, policy 4-41, personnel protection, personal protection from assault slash other acts. And then C, the technical and career education Carl Perkins for school year 24 grant. Are there any objections to the school board voting on the consent agenda items? Okay. Um, as I see none, then um, hearing none, I'm gonna ask for a motion for these consent agenda, um, agenda items. Do I have a motion? So moved, okay, and seconded by Mrs. Uh, Franklin. Moved by Mrs. Kimberly um, Melnick and seconded by Ms. Franklin. Okay. We will vote on this after the resolutions are read. I'm going to ask for the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month read by Ms. Franklin. Okay. Whereas the month of May is set aside to honor the contributions Asian American Pacific Islanders, AAP, have made to our city and country, and whereas Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are an integral part of the, our city's great mosaic of citizens, and whereas Virginia Beach has a significant Filipino population, at least 4% and growing, that continues to shape the city's culture, and whereas the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is an inherently diverse population comprised of more than 45 
25 distinct ethnicities and more than 100 language dialects. Now therefore be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach officially recognizes the month of May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to support, celebrate, and participate in various school and community activities during Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 25th day of April 2023. Thank you, Ms. Franklin. And for the Jewish American Heritage Month, I'm gonna ask Ms. Manning to read that, please. Ms. Manning had to leave, and now I'm going to go ahead and read uh, for So, Ms. Her. Owens, would you read that for us, please? Absolutely. Uh, Jewish American Heritage Month, May 2023. Whereas, whereas on April 20th, 2006, the federal government proclaimed that May would be Jewish American Heritage Month, a time to celebrate and recognize Jewish American contributions to American culture, history, education, government, and whereas the Jewish people have proudly sustained their identity and traditions while facing oppression, discrimination, and persecution, and whereas the Jewish, the Jewish community is strong and continue to devote their skills and energy to make invaluable contributions to our city and country through their leadership and achievements, and whereas issues currently affecting Jewish Americans, such as civil rights abuses, harmful stereotyping, harassment, and bullying must be combated in the forms of education and awareness, and whereas there is a need for public education, awareness, and policies that are culturally competent when describing, discussing, or addressing the impacts of being a Jewish American in all, in all aspects of American society, including discourse and policy, and now, therefore, be it resolved that Virginia Beach City Public Schools hereby recognizes May as Jewish American Heritage Month and supports opportunities for all students, staff, faculty, and members of the public to honor and learn more about Jewish American history and culture. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 25th day of April, 2023. Thank you, Ms. Owens. Now for Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, Vice Chair Weems. Whereas research shows that classroom teachers have a significant impact on student achievement and success, and whereas teachers' efforts in planning, teaching, and assessing directly impact student growth, and whereas teachers work in collaboration with school administrators to engage families and the community to create challenging, authentic learning opportunities for children, and whereas the school board appreciates the hard work and time teachers dedicate to support student achievement, both inside and outside of the classroom, and whereas this dedication contributes to a strong, positive school culture, and whereas the school division has partnered with our parents and community members to express our appreciation for teachers through the Love VB Teachers campaign. And whereas the school division uses this campaign to highlight the work of our extraordinary instructional staff throughout the entire school year, but especially during Teacher Appreciation Week. Now therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach officially recognizes May 8th through 12th, 2023 as Teacher Appreciation Week. And be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all community members to support and participate in activities designed to recognize teachers for their tireless work as educational leaders. And be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board. And be it further resolved that a copy copy of this resolution be distributed to each school in the division to be posted in a prominent location, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach on this day, the 25th day of April, 2023. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. Now I need, um, we've uh, made, called for a motion for, um, to pass the consent agenda. All in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we had nine ayes. The motion did pass. 
Thank you. And I know that um, Ms. Um, Martin has already um, gone off of Zoom, so. Um, now we're at the, um, the last part of our, or almost the last part, of action, our personnel report, administrative assignments, a call for a motion to approve the April 25th, 2023 personnel report and administrative appointments. Kim Melnick, do I have a second? Mrs. Anderson, um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Dr. Spence, do we have any assignments, administrative assignments? We do yet. We do. Sorry. Hold on. Yes, we do. <clears throat> um, we have Mr. Michael Tony Jr. He is uh, currently a teacher at the Advanced Technology Center. And this evening, you've accepted our recommendation for him to serve as the next coordinator for engineering and technology education in the Office of Career and Technology Education. So we send him our congratulations. And just as a reminder, uh, with a change in format, he will be back in two weeks for a formal introduction to the board. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, now we're on 16, the committee organization and board reports. Do any school board members- uh, Madam Chair, uh, we have uh, the, the assignment of the school board members. Oh, I'm sorry. Missed it, sorry. Um, we're on um, B, under action, the assignment of the school board members to the PPEA planning and advisory teams. You wouldn't think I'd miss this as much time as I've spent with this today in this past week. Um, anyway, I call for a motion to approve the assignment of the following school board members to the PPEA planning advisory teams as follows. Princess Anne High School planning advisory team will be Carolyn Weems and Beverly Anderson. For the Bayside High School Planning Advisory Team, Victoria Manning and Kathleen Brown. And for the Williams Elementary School and Bayside Sixth Grade Campus Planning Advisory Team, Stacy Martin and Jessica Owens. Do I have a motion to accept that? Yes, Mr. Callan, and do I have a second? Yes, Ms. Owens. Any discussion on these appointments? Okay, seeing none, uh, I call for a vote to approve the assignment of the school board members to the PPEA planning advisory teams as presented. All in favor, please raise your hands. Our Madam Chair, we have eight ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Now we're on 16. Um, the committee organization and board reports. Is there any... Um, School board members that have anything to report, as a reminder, this is just the time for a short report, and school board members may um, file full reports with the clerk to be distributed to other school board members at a different time. Yes, Ms. Owens, and then Ms. Um, Melnick. Just briefly, uh, yesterday, what was yesterday? Monday, the 24th, the Mental Health uh, Task Force Committee uh, met, and uh, they are working on a mental wellness fair that uh, is tentatively scheduled for June 3rd, uh, similar to vendor fairs that we've had with our back to school, uh, like at Landstown previously. Uh, and so as more information comes through with that, I'll be sending that out to the board uh, so that you all can share with any mental health partners, uh, mental wellness partners that uh, you may be aware of who may want to come out and participate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Melnick. Just a reminder that the audit committee um, will have its quarterly meeting on Thursday at one o'clock. Okay, and Ms. Weems. Yes, we um, had our workforce development meeting and it went very well. We had 10 in attendance and we really um, talked about some barriers of um, career and technical education. We focused on public relations, teacher shortage, and legislative um, state restrictions that can be handled legislatively. And so I'll have the full minutes for everybody, but we got a lot done, and um, I'm excited about the recommendations that we'll make. Thank you. Um, 
and let me just say there was a meeting for the legislative committee, and um, so <laughs> uh, Ms. Martin is uh, ill, and so she was unable to give that report, and it, and Mrs. Um, Manning uh, had to leave. Mr. Culpepper, would you like me to say something because I was in that meeting, or would you like to share anything? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I didn't take notes as well as I probably should have. If you want to start, I'll fill in with, uh, with what I've got that you, that you don't get. <laughs> Is that all right? <laughs> well, I mean, basically, you know, we just had a, a preliminary talk about next year's uh, legislative agenda, you know, just types of things that we um, might want to bring forth. And we'll be dealing with uh, getting that together by the end of the summer, like we usually do. Um, I, some of the things that were discussed were, were the things that, you guys talked about in your workforce committee and different things that maybe we can go before the state um, to work on and see if maybe some of those things to help um, kind of ease up some of the restrictions to help with that workforce. So, and we'll, we'll share more of that later as it comes about. Yeah, the, I think the only two that I can kind of restate without sounding like Tim Taylor, uh, one was related to um, Having certifications and certifications that our students are, earn uh, here yield equivalent credits uh, in college. I think it's similar to CLEP, but I'm not that familiar with CLEP, so I can't speak uh, too clearly about that one. Uh, and the other one was uh, related to apprenticeships and what you know, whether OSHA restrictions and/or state res restrictions limit our abilities to do apprenticeships. Uh, the OSHA restrictions, obviously, those are federal, uh, and we may or may not be able to move that needle at all. Uh, but where are there are state restrictions? Petition to change those. So they had a really, you know, as Ms. Williams said, lots of great th uh, suggestions and, and discussions in that workforce committee that maybe we can help with um, our legislative agenda. Yes, Ms. Um, Franklin. And I was just asked uh, to put out a reminder that starting um, May, learning loss grants will be available to students ages five to 19. Um, but we actually need teachers and organizations that are willing to assist in that endeavor. So if I'm going to make sure that I get this information out to um, Dr. Spence, what would be the best way to disseminate that to see if teachers that want to apply and be a part of that initiative? If you'll just send it to me, we'll make sure we get it out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I'll, I'll send it to Dr. Spence, who will then go ahead and get that information out. Thank you. I just want to say one other thing. I was, I, I've been to many activities and events and lots of visitations in the last couple of weeks. But one of the things that um, is happening tomorrow night at Corporate Landing Middle School is an event to showcase uh, the deaf learning students. Um, sounds like it's going to be uh, very interesting. So just thought I might throw that out there if anybody can go to that. The other thing is um, the Renaissance Academy is having a showcase of the house that the students built, which really was really interesting. So both of those things are happening tomorrow night around six to seven. Ms. Riggs, you may want to know is the governance you're going to change the time of the meeting, which would be next week's meeting? The governance, yes. And I believe PRC is also going to be moving. Your governance is moving back to 1.30 on May 3rd. PRC, I believe, is moving up to 10.30, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. and they're the following week. Okay. 10 o'clock. Okay. But, and, the, and the governor's meeting is the third. We're going to move it to 1.30, okay? Mm -hmm. I know that there are some people that have a discipline committee, but uh, we've looked at the agenda. I think we'll be fine. Uh, Ms. Melnick. Um, earlier this evening, the board got an email from Kellum High School Band Director Cameron Baker, um, inviting us um, and open to the public and free um, to join them um, as the U.S. Navy Jazz Ensemble will be there. So if you like jazz and you'd like a free night of music, uh, 7 o'clock tomorrow night at Kellum High School. That's tomorrow night. Oh, let me let me change my uh, house, the, the Renaissance and the corporate landing. That's Thursday night. Sorry, it's not tomorrow night. It's Thursday night. Okay, so we are now at the end of our meeting, and we're going to return 
to our closed session. We have one thing that we need to discuss. So um, I am going to ask uh, Vice Chair Weems to read it in a closed session. After she does, um, I'll ask for a second call for a vote and we'll transition back to the Einstein Lab. I move the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the exceptions to open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711 Part A, Paragraph 27819 as amended to deliberate on the following matters. Two, discussion or consideration of admission or disciplinary matters or any other matters that would involve the disclosure of information contained in a scholastic record concerning any student of any public institution of higher education in the Commonwealth or any state school system. However, any such student, legal counsel, and if the student is a minor, the student's parents or legal guardians shall be permitted to be present during the taking of testimony or presentation of evidence at a closed meeting. If such student, parents, or guardians so request in writing, and such request is submitted to the presiding officer of the appropriate board. Seven, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or in which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a, me a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on the matter. Eight, consultation with legal counsel and employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision will be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted. Nineteen. Discussion of plans to protect public safety as it relates to terrorist activity or specific cybersecurity threats or vulnerab vulnerabilities and briefings by staff members, legal counsel, or law enforcement or emergency service officials concerning actions taken to respond in such matters or, related, or a related threat to public safety. Discussing, uh, discussion of information subject to the exclusion in subdivision 2 or 14 of 2.2-37052 where discussion in an open meeting would jeopardize the safety of any person or the security of any facility, building, structure, information, technology system, or software program, or discussion of reports or plans related to the security of any governmental facility, building, structure, or program, or the safety of persons using such facility, building, or structure namely to discuss A, student discipline and school security measures for specific cases, B, appointment of discrimination hearing officer, C, consultation with legal counsel regarding probable litigation and pending litigation matters. Second. Okay, so the motion's been made by Ms. Weems and seconded by Ms. Uh, Melnick. All in favor to move to closed session, please raise your hand. We have nine eyes to go and to close the motion to pass. Thank you. you. Yes, we're going, we have 10 minutes to get to our Einstein lab. Ask Ms. Uh, Weems, our vice chair, to read out of closed session and then we will vote. Whereas the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach has convened a closed meeting and the, on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by this school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting, re meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in this closed meeting to which this certification applies and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Okay, the motion has, the motion has been made by Ms. Weems, seconded by Mrs. Anderson. All in favor to go out of closed session, please raise your hand. Madam Chair, we have nine eyes. The motion did pass. Okay, so now I'm going to read the motion of what we want to do with this complaint from um, Ms. Morse on Zadian Morse. Not just look at that, but to read it the way it is, 
Okay. Okay. I make a, I move that the school board authorize the school board attorney or designee to hire hearing officers for student discrimination complaint appeal hearings. Do I have a second? Second. Second, Ms. Franklin. All in favor, please raise your hand. We have eight ayes. All nays, please raise your hand. Okay. Abstentions. All abstentions. One. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, the motion did pass with eight ayes, no nays, and one abstention. Do you want these back? Uh, you have to adjourn the meeting. You have to adjourn the meeting. And I adjourn this meeting at 1118. <laughs>